Today's discussions will be, there are about um, 10 topics that are ripe for discussion in February. We won't be discussing them in depth today. But the feedback that we're going to need is which of those topics do you want on the agenda? So we're just setting the agenda topics for February. Think if this is something you want to hear more about at that period of time or if it's something that you don't want on the agenda, then we can discuss it at another time or not at all if you prefer. The first one is the November 28 ballot issues. We do, it seems like a long time in advance to be thinking about that. But for the November 2018 election, we actually need to have all of that information together for the voter information pamphlet by March of 2018. So if there's anything on the police training center or the streets projects um, that are additional that you want more information on that we need to study more in depth, this gives us about a year to look into that and get back with you on whatever your direction is. What, what do you need to have a comfort level in making a decision at that point in time? The next one is the 2017 streets bonds. We are looking to go out to issue on these bonds uh, in probably the April, May time period in 2017. So February is a great time for us to talk about structure. Things like, do we want to be targeting a level levy or do we want to be targeting a level rate at that period of time? Because we can structure the bonds to do either one and we can talk about the projects and everything that, is in, that, are, in the, that are in the bonds or we're proposing for the bonds. A third topic would be the 2018 CIP. Um, Kristen Myers, when she gives her presentation later today, will be discussing this, but this can be an opportunity for council to look at all of those projects and have discussion ahead of the adoption schedule, and it would be ahead of some of the public input with our stakeholders as well, so you can see what's being proposed. February timeframe gives us uh, enough time to be able to get all of our data together so that you have the full proposal for 2018. And that's really in response to the fact that we've all asked for more time to review and we do have it usually in the one-on-ones we'll give you the CIP information each year but this would give you an opportunity to discuss it with everyone in the room as uh, have you all together for a public meeting Another is Gilbert Regional Park, looking at uh, where, uh, where are we at with the funding plan, um, land sale or progress update, all of those types of information gives us a little bit of time to put that together and ready for you. I know Rod's got some information today as well. Replacement fund policy, we are looking at the money that we're putting into the replacement funds. Um, we're looking at all of them, including the streets fund and um, look to have some recommendations for you on what do we really need in those funds and do some additional policy around that. Depending on the outcome of this policy direction would make a difference on our funding and sustainability rates, particularly in the water fund, we transfer about $10 million a year into our replacement fund. If that's what we need, then that's what we need to continue to do. But it may be, uh, it, we're right on the balance, we think it might start to cause a rate increase. And so if we look at sustainability, and first we know if we're transferring in the amount we need in our replacement fund, then that helps us have a good foundation for decision making on what our rates need to be for sustainability long term. Um, another is the long term financial plan. We've been working behind the scenes and putting together about through 2030, what happens, the, de the decisions that we make today financially, how do they impact us with revenues and expenditures? And we've got that model started. We're working on refining that, but we should have that ready for rollout to you in February so we can go through what if analysis and some decision making and thoughts on how does our budget look long term and how are the decisions, which ones are impactful over time and which ones really make not a lot of difference. It's a dynamic model and so we can go through a lot of questions with that. Another is the PSPRS unfunded liability. The 2016 actuarial report should be out by that time so we can see what's been the effect of the um, funding that we've been putting towards it, what are any of the new changes in that area that might affect us, we can give a status update. Another is the health trust. We will have about six months of data at that point in time and so we'll be able to come back with you with some recommendations on what are the trends looking like, what do we think we might need to make um, decisions or changes moving forward into fiscal 18 and it'll give us an opportunity for discussion in that area. So these are all of the proposed topics. What I need from you is which of those are you interested in hearing and which would you prefer to see in another venue not at the February retreat.
Um, well, our next topic here is on the compensation benefits. And as Patrick opened up earlier, he talked about that Gilbert's uh, mission is to be a service organization committing to enhance the quality of, our, of life. We can't accomplish that without the great employees we have here in Gilbert. With that, we have our comp, comp and class philosophy that helps as a guiding tool in terms of how we hire our great employees, our, we recruit for our uh, great employees and offer career development. With the philosophy that we adopted back in February 2012, we also are committed to ensuring alignment with our philosophy. And so we recently conducted a study. And so the presentation we have today that we're going to talk about um, helps set that parameters for next week's uh, council meeting uh, in terms of adopting um, what staff is proposing um, as a result of the, of the study. And we'll go through that. Since our last study um, that was conducted about three, four years ago, uh, we have seen challenges as it relates to retaining talent, recruiting talent, and rewarding talent here in the organization. When we looked at um, our re retaining talent, one of the things that we need to look at is the cost of turnover. We've seen turnover increase year over year, and we're about to hit double digits again, which is a concern to the organization. So what we've done is we uh, applied um, a way that we can look at what is the cost of turnover from a very conservative perspective. What does that look like for Gilbert? And what we did is we took what are, what's the number of the positions amongst the different band levels in the organization. So an A band employee is your frontline employee. A B band is more of your um, technical skilled um, employees. Uh, C band is going to be your exempt um, professional level. D band is your manager level and E band is your executive level. So then from there what we did is we looked at what's the average salary amongst those bands uh, in the organization. Again we're looking at what is that cost of turnover going to be. And so from there we looked at what would be the cost to replace at those different levels in the organization and we took 75% um, of the annual salary. What includes in that, what's included in, the, in that 75% is the onboarding, the lost time, um, the training that goes into it. This doesn't factor in the additional, maybe more technical um, training, you know, that we have in PD and, and also in fire. Um, so that would be something in addition. However, you can see for an A-band employee um, to replace that would be about 26,000, very conservative um, shot there. Um, what we've seen in the organization is um, what did we say about 20, was it 23% of our um, C-Ban and above um, w uh, has left the organization in just the last, uh, I think actually that was just based on the last year when I looked at these numbers. Um, and so what we did is we took that 75th percent or 75 percent of the annual salary and said what does that cost per band and so again drawing down further what is that overall cost the overall cost just looking at last year's turnover rate is 4.8 million dollars so we do have some re retention issues here and we'll talk about how that aligns with um, currently with our compensation and and the recommendations that we're proposing for you for next week and, and just to expand on what Carrie just said what we did is we looked at the turnover rate and and, and because we've lost a lot of the, the leaders and supervisors in the organization, either be through you know, retirement or, or, or moving on or, or other reasons. And that numbers for us is, is, is very high. It's like 30%, as Carrie said. Um, that was like 50, 50 positions mm -hmm. out of a roughly two to 300, about 25% turnover in, that, in, in the leadership of your organization, which we do not believe is a sustainable um, sustainable in the long run. So one of the other challenges we have or that we're facing in regards to retaining talent is the current ranges and how our pay practices um, are currently in, in place, particularly for the non-sworn. We know the sworn is a step in grade and that is working well for them. Um, in terms of the non-sworn though, currently the earning potential is between the minimum and the midpoint, the 50th percentile of the market. Um, right now, anything beyond that is a one-time um, based on performance, and so what we're seeing in the organization is our peer groups are using the full range, and so they're jumping to our peer organizations. We're losing that talent for them to go um, make, have a higher earning potential there. 
Um, they're for, what we're hearing too from employees is that, um, and we know as far as the, the future base earnings is unknown at this time. Um, right now we've been implementing the one-time distributions and so again that's that's another um, factor in terms of how we're losing, losing um, our talent. When we look at um, our talent here too, what we've heard from um, exit interviews and even just some of the day-to-day -day conversations is our current structure right now, there's a disincentive to promote within the organization. And it, that was one of the study findings that we heard about was our current structure, if you promote from one band to another, that might be a 15%, but then the next level it's a 5%. So there's there's some inconsistencies in terms of how our current structure is, is in place. And with adopting the new structure we're proposing to council next week, you'll see there's a natural progression from grade to grade um, between a 7% and a 15%, and that's more of your, your typical type of spread in terms of the structure. That's promotional. Promotional. Promotional yep. progression. Um, as we look at the recruitment uh, ch challenges around recruitment, uh, right now we know that the study finding came back that we're lagging the market by 4% um, on aggregate. Um, right now we're having challenges recruiting for some of the key talent. We know we've gone out about three times, I think, for town engineer. Um, we've got the fire, uh, the plans examiner. Um, I know for the comp administrator, we've gone out three times and she starts on Monday. Um, and the, you know, there's some key positions that we're having challenges in terms of uh, recruiting for. What we're seeing is Gilbert's, um, our valuable talent, um, we're becoming vulnerable because we're starting to, they, they see the talent that we're growing um, and they're getting snagged up by other organizations. Um, and then also you've seen recently where we've had to reach out to contract services for plans review and when we looked at last fiscal year I think we were at um, I think it was about 146 does that sound right and we're about 80,000 um, year to date there's there's some pending there but again when you look at a fully loaded position we were we're already exceeding um, that currently uh, one of the other things too, when we were looking at our peer groups and looking at how their pay practices are, we wanted to find out, you know, do they have philosophies? And we do have a, a really good philosophy um, that we support in the organization. Um, we'll see that from our peer groups, though, not very many of them have that. What that means is that they have greater flexibility in their hiring practices, and so there's some key technical positions um, where we've we've gotten into challenges with some of our peer groups as far as they they know that we that we anchor to the 50th percentile, and they know that 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 we don't have much room after that, um, and so we start getting into kind of a negotiation, and we start losing that talent because of the greater flexibility um, that the other municipalities have. And, and the use that they have for full range within, within their practices. When we look at rewarding talent, so we have implemented the pay for performance approach in the organization. And, um, and so right now, as I mentioned earlier, that, that um, the performance merit adjustments are currently one time. And so that future earning potential is still uncertain um, and has become more of a disincentive and we're starting to lose, lose folks on that. So again, that's more so for the non-sworn there. When we look at the study findings, I know that was a lot of information that was back in uh, June um, that was presented to council. Um, what they were recommending was um, a redesign of the salary structure. And with that, they recommend aligning with the 55th percentile of average actuals for sworn and for non-sworn. Um, they also recommend the ability to use the full range. Uh, we talked about that here um, this morning. And also with that, we would apply uh, a merit matrix in order to progress in the range based on uh, individual's performance. Uh, what they recommended too was to model specialty pay and overtime pay practices. Um, they said that our pay was, um, was competitive in the market, but to look at the different pay approach, whether it's a flat rate or a percentage. Um, when it came to the benefits, they suggested looking at the life insurance. One of the things that we were lagging the market, they suggested um, under insurance was to either increase or remove uh, the annual salary max. Of the, we have a limit of 100,000. Um, for the holidays, they suggested us to model um, increasing the holidays from 10 days to 11 or 12 days. And then for personal leave, um, specifically for firefighters, they recommended modeling increasing the number of days granted per year. And then for long-term disability, for public safety, um, they suggested increasing the monthly max to 3,000. 
And then for short-term disability, um, they, they suggested uh, decreasing our waiting period of 90 days. So what you'll see presented uh, in the upcoming council um, packet uh, for next week is staff's recommendations. So what we're recommending is uh, the redesign of the salary structure to align with the 55th percentile of market. Um, and that's both for sworn and for non-sworn. Um, you'll see a recommendation for the full use of range in terms of our pay practices for moving forward and building our future for going forward. Um, for modeling, um, we did model the specialty pay and we don't have recommendations to move forward with changing how that pay practice is currently. As it relates to the benefits, we do recommend removing the, the maximum limit. Um, when we reached out to our provider, there is no financial impact to our current contract on that. Um, when we looked at the holidays, um, we feel as though that we're competitive within the market and so that we don't, rec we don't recommend increasing that as um, the consultant had recommended. Uh, we feel we are competitive at this point in time. When we looked at the personal leave for firefighters, um, this was another area where we have really um, moved as an organization as a one team um, culture. And so to silo out one particular position, we felt as though that that would veer away from that. In addition, we know the additional cost and overtime to cover those shifts um, is also another, another factor there. When we looked at the long-term disability, we do agree with um, with increasing the monthly max from 3,000 to 5,000, and that was another thing where the, our provider, um, that there's no financial impact to that. And then the short-term disability, we feel as though that we're competitive and that we have our sick leave uh, policy in place that will help cover that waiting period of 90 days to offset that, okay? So as a high-performing um, government, you may ask why 55th percentile? Um, at the same time that Mercer um, provided the results of the study, we also, uh, Mary presented the benchmark report. And as you know, we've seen, we have seen several um, metrics in which we have been leading the market. Um, and to name a few, we've got um, the number of fleet vehicles uh, maintained per technician, permit turnarounds for residents and commercial, for residential and commercial, our um, call center average answer speed for utility calls, um, as well as our percentage of building inspector um, performed in a, in, a, in a day. There's other accolades that we've also um, received, um, you know, we continue to receive as a high performing organization. Um, you know, we're the, the 85th um, largest um, a city, fifth uh, largest in Arizona. And so, um, and as we know, we've got our AAA um, rating and whatnot. So what does this mean? So also going into that 55th percentile, what that means is we've got our minimum, midpoint, and our max. Our current range is set around the midpoint of, of our benchmark positions at the 50th percentile. So what's being recommended is to move that slightly, but also looking at average actual. So we're kind of, you know, to compare the prior study to the current study, that's looking at apples and oranges. So um, since we used to look at midpoints and now we're looking at average actuals. Carrie, oh. before, and Patrick, you may want to say something about mm -hmm. this. This this 50, this distribution is not our current distribution. Correct. If you were to look at our current <coughs> distribution, it goes up to the 50 and drops immediately down to the green line right. and goes straight across. So that's, right. that, that's a... We are not we are not using the full range. So that bell curve that that's illustrated is actually incorrect, as Mark indicated. So that it goes to the 50th and then it drops, and that's creating real issues for us in attraction of talent mm -hmm. as well as in retention of talent. When they realize once they've gotten there, they're 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 going no further, and, and there will be no further advancement for them. And then it makes us very vulnerable to other communities. They're using the full uh, bandwidth they've got within their range, um, and we're feeling the consequences. Mm -hmm. that. And, and there's a, a real cost to us that's short-sighted beyond just allowing some of our um, exemplary employees to move further into that range uh, than we currently are. And as, and as Kerry said, because our competitors know what our midpoints are, they, they know what the competition is. So if, if we're trying to attract a plans examiner from another community or that they're, they're looking at the valley, um, Scottsdale or Mesa or whatever, they know what our pay rate is, so they offer more than our pay rate, and it's a very easy decision for some of those folks that, are, that we're trying to recruit. 
So in the recommendations you'll see next week then, we are recommending and supporting um, the consultant's recommendation to move to the 55th percentile um, based on our high performing organization um, that they acknowledged in their report as well as um, recommending the full use of, of range um, so that we can retain our talent and reward them for the accomplishments on their performance. Um, so with that, that will, adjust, that will occur, a, address the issue and round um, our market value in the position, the career progression, uh, the, the disincentive that will correct that issue. Um, we will also, um, with accepting that recommendation, we'll be able to have future earnings um, to base versus one time. Um, and then that will also, we'll see a reduction in that turnover rate there and reward for performance. So one of the things in terms of what's the financial impact that um, based on these recommendations that you'll see, we set aside $5 million this fiscal year to be applied towards the study findings. Uh, when we modeled the recommendations and um, came up with the implementation plan that we're proposing to council, um, what we recommend is uh, upon implementation, it would cost $3.5 million um, to move those that need to have market alignment. This does not mean that everyone sees an adjustment. It does not mean that it's an automatic 5%. Um, we want to look at relative position in, in, in range and make sure that we still value the employees in terms of where they're currently placed. So that would cost um, to move into the new structure $3.5 million. Um, that equates to about 54% of the organization um, that would see movement at, time, at the time of implementation. Again, that's to realign them with the market. Um, when we break that down further, that's about 265 non-sworn employees and about 400 sworn. So of the non-sworn, we have about a little over 800. So you can kind of, that order of magnitude, um, again, goes back to it's not a 5% across the board. Uh-huh. Three point five out of the five. Out of the five, yes. And so, with the remaining one point five, um, what we recommend is to allocate that towards the merit-based adjustments uh, in June when we close out the fiscal year with a performance management system. And not to be automatically distributed, but that would be just the pot of money that would be yeah. available for distribution. Yeah, and we would apply that merit matrix in order to to move individuals appropriately um, based on performance. And so in terms of next steps, um, you'll see on the council agenda next week, um, requesting council adoption of the recommendations. Uh, following that, then we will roll out an education plan to the organization. Uh, we've met with directors and uh, managers in terms of how positions are slotted in the new structure to get input on that. Um, so we'll carry that forward. And then plan to implement in November. And the implementation, um, the, the financials that I just shared with you, that factors in a July 1 effective date, or July 4th effective date, first pay period of the fiscal year. Um, and then come June, um, those that didn't see any, any movement at the time of moving into the uh, new structure, then we would apply our pay, pay for performance um, through, that would close out the performance fiscal year. We should be able to walk through some of the findings that the committee, subcommittee had for your consideration. So the ask of you today is to consider the recommendations that the subcommittee is going to put forward with regard to the commissions and boards that the town currently has. The objective of the review that we undertook was really just to make sure that all of our boards and commissions have a current relevant purpose, uh, that their mandate is clear, that they're adding real value to the town, that they're as efficient and effective as possible. And one final point that was an important consideration is making sure that as these boards and commission volunteers are working with us in the town, that that represents a meaningful use of their time. Everybody's busy. We want to make sure that these folks, uh, that they're using their time in a meaningful way. Some of the considerations that we uh, looked at uh, was everything from how often these groups are meeting, making sure that they have a clear and well understood mandate, uh, that, they're, uh, that they're adding that value to the town that we want, that the size is appropriate, and so forth. So just to give you a quick look at what the town's current boards and commissions look like, we currently have eight boards. We have one authority, two corporations, one trust, and three commissions. Um, of those, we walked through each one of those and had a conversation about how each one of them is functioning. We have the Arts and Culture Board, the Design Review Board, uh, the Police Public Safety Retirement System, Local Pension Board, the Fireman's Pension and Relief Fund, Parks, Recreation and Library Service Advisory Board, the Environmental and Energy Conservation Advisory Board, Utilities Board, Fire Public Safety Retirement System, 
pension board, all in small font, I apologize. We also have one IDA, our Industrial Development Authority. We have two corporations, that's one is for water and one is our Municipal Property Corporation. We have our trust, that's our self-insured trust that we've talked about for health benefits. On the commission side, the Human Relations Commission, the Redevelopment Commission, and our Planning Commission. So of those, the group identified four of our boards, the two corporations, and two commissions as areas that we wanted to spend a little bit more time digging into. We reviewed all of them, but these were the ones where there were some questions about efficiency, effectiveness that we thought deserved further consideration. On the Arts and Culture Board side, I'll just walk through some of the thoughts that, that the, the subcommittee had. Uh, there seems to be a lack of clear focus and, and uh, direction with the Arts and Culture Board. There is some sentiment among the group there that they don't have the resources that they need in order to be able to take meaningful action in the community. The Parks, Recreation, and Library Service Advisory Board is actually a very high functioning group. It's working well. It just has a really long title was one of the, the, the thoughts there, is that usually you need to take a deep breath and read a piece of paper to get the whole title down. Uh, the Environmental and Energy Conservation Advisory Board, they haven't met in over a year. They're currently lacking some members and there is, lack, there is a scene as a lack of need for that, that group right now and uh, not a particularly strong uh, mandate or it's, it's functionally not, uh, not working right now. The Utilities Board, uh, it's required in order for us to get our preferred power rates through the Parker Davis and Hoover Dam hydroelectric generating plants. And so that's really a required board. We don't want that to go anywhere. One of the thoughts with that, though, is that they meet more frequently than is needed. Uh, I think one of the comments I heard back was, if you just change the date on the minutes, you'd almost get them right every time. <laughs> so, so an interest in maybe reducing the frequency of how often that group meets. Uh, the corporations, we wanted to look at if there was an opportunity to maybe combine the Municipal Property Corporation and the Water Resources uh, Corporation. At the end of the day, as we went through and looked at some of the uh, brain damage that would be required, legal, administrative, looking at how to combine the, uh, the debt with those, there really wasn't a great ROI on that. Really what you're going to do is reduce your annual meetings from two to, to one. So not a lot of interest at the end of the day in making changes there with our commissions. The, Humans Relation, the Human Relations Commission was seen as having a, a very broad mandate. Uh, they're struggling with some of that purpose and, and why they're existing and what their, their real core mandate is and, and what they're trying to accomplish there. So further conversation on that on our, on our next slide. <clears throat> the Redevelopment Commission, as you know, uh, Gilbert has a redevelopment area. It's required to have a commission to go along with that through state statute. Uh, the challenge there is perhaps a little bit of scope creep in what that commission is asking for. Functionally, they're a design review board for the redevelopment area, so they would be receiving applications as those come in. There's a little bit more uh, energy being directed towards taking on projects and things like that, so maybe some additional um, conversation around narrowing in the scope of that group and clarifying their mandate was seen as useful. One other thing I'll mention, the design review board, planning commission, you're all aware a lot of work's already gone on with combining those two, so we didn't spend a lot more time talking about that. So the uh, proposed boards and commission structure uh, takes away three of our boards and one of our commissions and converts those into a task force concept. The idea is that we still maintain a list of interested people who might want to serve on those and as needed as the council sees a need to activate those to address a pressing purpose or concern in the community, that can occur. So that's, this is the fundamental proposal and w along with those, to be a little bit more specific, you're asked, there's eight asks or uh, recommendations, if you will, from the subcommittee. Uh, first uh, is to take the Arts and Culture Board and convert that into a task force. And so as needs arise in the community or as council sees uh, an interest in activating that, uh, there is some conversation right now in the Heritage District around developing an Arts and Culture Master Plan. Uh, if that is something that comes to fruition, that may be something that council would say, okay, let's take that task force, activate it, and use that to help implement that plan. If there is nothing pressing, though, those can remain dormant until there is a need to be activated. Uh, the Parks, Recreation, and Library Service Advisory Board. That's the last time you're going to Nate, perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. Thank you. Uh, the recommendation there is just to rename that to the Parks and Recreation Board. Uh, still high-functioning group. No further changes seen as necessary. Uh, the Environmental and Energy Conservation Advisory Board, also the recommendation would be to convert that into a task force, activate if there is a need. Uh, the Utilities Board, 
is to reduce the frequency of those meetings from quarterly to semi-annually. So just take a few less, uh, take a few meetings off the schedule um, and allow them to meet a little bit less frequently. The, humans relation, the Human Relations Commission, I keep messing up. I want to say humans. There's so many of them, it just doesn't feel right to say human. Uh, the uh, recommendation again, convert that to a task force and activate as needed. Uh, and some further work may be used uh, on that as well to further narrow in and focus the, uh, the purpose of that group so they have a very clear mandate when they are activated of what it is we're trying to accomplish. The RDC, uh, again, review the roles and responsibilities. Uh, in town code as well as the bylaw to make sure that their mandate is clear. And in a lot of cases, you don't have to make a lot of changes to what's already in our code. It's really about education and making sure that the members of these, these uh, boards and commissions have a clear understanding of what the expectations are on them so that we're able to narrow in and they're able to accomplish their mandate effectively without worrying about or, uh, or having scope creep problems. Two further things at the very end of this here, bylaws. Uh, we wanted to, and are recommending a review of all of our boards and commission bylaws as well as the town code to make sure that they are, they are consistent, that they're clear, and that there's some uniformity among those. As you, I'm sure, know, a lot of these have evolved over a number of years, even decades, and they are not consistently written. Some of them have a lot of detail, some of them have a lot less detail, and the format and how they're displayed is different. Some work just to try to make those uniform and uh, present them in a consistent fashion is recommended as well. Finally, our website. There is some uh, refresh needed to our website to make sure that it's easier for members of the community to understand what boards and commissions we have, what their mandate is, and just cleaning up the website, and that's a project that the clerk's office has got on their schedule, wants some direction to make sure that they're on the right track with that as well. Collectively together, those are the recommendations of the subcommittee that we're looking for some direction for. This is a, a presentation on, on self-certification, and toward the end you'll see that there's um, some recommendations, uh, three different recommendations, and that'll be our ask, is to get directions from the council on those, those three different recommendations on which way to move forward. So first, what is self-certification? Um, it's really just a process by which registered professionals, and in this case it's um, architects and engineers, certify that the construction drawings that they're submitting to the jurisdiction are drawn to meet current code requirements. And the reason that they're certifying these is because there is no formal plan review that's done by the jurisdiction prior to the issuance of the building permit. So the building permit is issued and then the plan review occurs in the field by the building inspector at the same time the construction is going on. So this is not a new process, a, a new program to speak. Um, there is a version of it in New York City, there's a version of it in Chicago, and then you'll remember a couple years ago, um, Councilman Sal DeCicio brought it um, into the city of Phoenix. I, take a of it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he'd enjoy that up there, so. Um, We've chosen to kind of base the presentation on the Phoenix process because that's the one that's that sort of spread through the valley and, and seems to be getting the attention and the discussion. So the Phoenix process is, is fairly simple. Um, you need to be an architect or an engineer that's been registered in the state of Arizona for at least three years. Um, you have to attend and pass a self-certification training class that's put on by the City of Phoenix. They hold the classes a couple times a year, cost ranges from about $500 to about $1,500 for the class, depending upon what you're getting certified for. Certification's good for about three years, then you must take a, a recertification class, which costs about $150. Before you can even enter the, the self-certification process itself and submit your plans, you have to obtain all your approvals. So any planning approvals, site approvals, site plan approvals, any of that stuff must be done before you can even come uh, and submit your, um, your application and your plan. So there is some upfront work that occurs prior to the, the submission. There's a 25,000 square foot um, kind of cutoff that occurs. Um, anything that's less than 25,000 square feet and has a structural element to it, um, the city requires a structural peer review certificate. So essentially what that is is somebody that is self-certified or that's in on an approved list by the city reviews that plan for that person who's self-certified, provides a certificate, and then that's submitted with the application to the town or to the city. Uh, if it's greater than 25,000 square feet and has structural elements to it, the city will, will perform um, a, a plan review for it. You, you must have the, the plan review before moving forward. Sorry, what does that happen in the process? 
Um, if you'll wait till the next slide, I'll show you exactly where it happened. Um, the self-certification process in Phoenix does not apply at all to fire plans or fire permits. And you'll, you'll kind of see that theme as we go through. Anything that's a higher, or a higher hazardous um, occupancy or, or hazardous type does not fall within the, the self-certification process. And then, of course, there's a, a hold harmless letter and certificates of insurance that are required for any of the uh, folks that are going through the process. Here is the step-by-step um, -step process that, that Phoenix has, and I, I won't walk you through each one of these, but um, I will hit some of the highlights. It's, it's all very small. So the research and the pre-submittal is when all of that uh, work is done by the applicant before they ever um, even approach the, the city of Phoenix. Step three is when they first set a, a meeting with a, a senior engineering tech. They come in, the senior engineering tech just checks the application, makes sure everything looks okay. A fee is paid and then they move into um, actually taking um, the plans in. So in step five of eight, the applicant sits down with the team of folks from the city. Um, they do a cursory review of the plans to make sure that they meet the, the requirements of the program, and then they will um, permit the, the, they'll process the permit, they'll take in the plan uh, and issue the permit. What we've um, talked to some folks about is the timing of this. And from step five, the intake, when the actual plan is dropped off to the time the plan is picked up is about a five to seven day window. So this is not happening immediately. It's not happening over the counter, but it's about a five to seven day process um, getting through that, um, that, that program. Um, the other thing I want to mention is through this program, there's about, there's a team of 25 people that the city of Phoenix has that administers this program. Anything from the classes to the different disciplines, they've got 25 people that are set up to do the self-certification program. Pro, uh, projects that are eligible in Phoenix, um, interior alterations, um, tenant build-outs of certain different types of occupancies, um, Business, mercantile, factory, assembly, storage. Again, you're not getting into anything that's hazardous. Um, again, it's, there's different tenant build-outs uh, for different occupancies. Um, they're not the, the hazardous occupancy types. Um, and then some of the simpler plans, landscape, grading, drainage, stormwater, parking lots, things that are not eligible for the projects, high-rise buildings, hillside development, anything that, that requires a, a little more of a foundation extra large assemblies such as the arenas, things of that nature, hazardous occupancies, fireworks, chemicals, uh, those things, and then anything that's, that's um, contained within the floodplain. So who's doing um, self-certification in the valley? Um, you'll see Gilbert's up there. Um, each one of these different jurisdictions has taken the self-certification process and tweaked it. Um, they do it based on the risk that the city wants to take, they base it on council's direction, they base it on um, different things that, that's just within that community. Gilbert's self-certification is called the one and done. Um, it's slightly different. Um, what we do is it's an eight-day turnaround. We have folks come in and give us the plans. We take one look at the plans. We give them back any comments or red lines then the architect or engineer self-certifies that those issues will be addressed in the field. So now when our building inspector goes out into the field, they've got revised plans that have been reviewed once and they're looking for that as, as they move forward. So you've got a five to seven day type process in Phoenix through the whole thing. We've got an eight day process that, that um, at least gives us one plan review. So um, I'll go over the commonalities of these different programs too. Um, most of, a lot of the other jurisdictions aren't as robust as the one in Phoenix. It, it's the big one, but they've also got, you know, this team of 25 folks that are able to kind of usher the uh, projects through. Every one of the programs, you have to be an architect or engineer with at least three years of, of experience in, in the, the state of Arizona. Um, some of the jur different jurisdictions require an International Code Council Certificate for Plan Review. Um, that's what the Town of Gilbert has for our plan reviewers. They all have certificates uh, from the International Code Council. Uh, or you complete uh, the Phoenix class. Now this is a little different in that, let's say, surprise follows what the City of Phoenix does. They say if you're on the City of Phoenix's self-certification program, you're fine to, to come in and, and use our program. As you go through those classes in the city of Phoenix, they go over the 
program itself. They go over the building codes, but they also go over the amendments to the building codes um, that Phoenix has. So there's a little bit of a disconnect between the surprise building codes and the Phoenix building codes, but surprise is accepting the class that you go through in Phoenix. So a little bit, little bit different. Um, all of the jurisdictions required the hold harmless letters and the, the certificates of insurance. Um, in every case, the inspectors become the plan reviewers in the field. Um, and then there's always a potential for audits. So as we mentioned earlier, some of the structural components are, are audited. And then there's usually about 10% of the plans um, are audited through the process. So the permit is issued, construction's underway, but staff will pull those permits back and do an actual audit, go through it to make sure that the folks that are performing those self-certifications are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if they don't, there's some, some consequences and you could be um, eventually kicked out of the program if you're not um, following the, the right process. Um, I did mention Gilbert's plan review, the one and done. I wanted to just touch base on some of the other things. Oh, I'm sorry. These are the other commonalities. So they're all tenant improvements that you're seeing through most of the other jurisdictions. Um, Again, not the high hazard uh, things, but, uh, but business, mercantile storage, and factory. Um, the program in most jurisdictions exclude these things. Anything that's over two stories, um, anything that's greater than 25,000 square feet. Um, and then again, we get into the more hazardous things. Commercial kitchens, group H, which is high hazard, high piled storage, floodplain, and then some of the other, some of the other issues there. So I did mention Gilbert's uh, one and done. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about what other plan review processes we have in place. If you'll remember, probably three, four years ago, we put in a whole different list of plan review pro programs in order to provide a menu for, for applicants coming in. We wanted to try to provide programs that they could use to meet their needs and their timing. So um, last fiscal year, we did a total of 5,246 non-residential permits. Um, just to keep adding to that, we did 1,827 single family permits and 1,247 engineering permits. So just in the last fiscal year, we did 8,315 permits. You're gonna notice that these numbers don't add up to 8,000. These are just the number of permits that went through those processes. If they're not in those numbers, they just went through our normal process. Our normal turnaround times for these processes, I'll, I'll get to our normal Turnaround time is 13 working days for a new building. So you come in and within 13 days we'll have your plans turned around and back out to you. For TIs, it's eight days as I, as I had mentioned. If you come in and do an expedited plan review, we cut the time in half for you. So you go from 13 to six. Um, and then that also happens with your second review. So instead of it being an eight day, it'd be a four day for the second review. Um, over the counter, um, we do some immediate. Um, that depends on the number of folks we have at the front counter, um, whether or not we've got a backlog of plans, how many people are standing at the front counter. We, we won't let the line extend out the door while we review something. Um, but you can see we were able to do 759 permits over the counter last year. Express permitting is for smaller projects, some of the smaller TIs, and we've got a three-day turnaround um, time on those. Permit by appointment is an interesting project. Um, what we have the applicant do is submit their plans. We take our review team and spend um, 10 days reviewing those, and then we invite their design team to come in, sit down, review the plans with us, make any corrections, and then we'll issue the permit on spot if, if everything's addressed. Um, we did that three times. And then the one and done, which I was saying is, is kind of our version right now of the self-certification, we did 29 permits. Probably the biggest one we get for the bang, um, which may tweak a little bit now that the Design Review Board and Planning Commission are combined, is the at-risk plan review. And what we were doing is if somebody went through Design Review Board and went to a study session and the Design Review Board gave the nod at the plan, said, you know, this looks really good, we'd just like to see a color changed, or, but the physical layout in the building looks fine, we would allow them to submit their construction drawings prior to the actual approval by the Design Review Board. So that would save them at least four to six weeks um, right there in that process. So that was a very, a very good process for us. So the benefits of the self-certification. Um, it's obviously development friendly. So a program like this just, just tells uh, the development community that we're open to business, we're development friendly. Uh, we want to move forward and help you the best we can. Um, the next two kind of tie together. Um, it's speed of issuance um, because there's no, there's no review up front. 
Um, the review happens on the back end. So we do an administrative review to make sure that everything's taken in and, and uh, present, um, and we're able to issue that permit uh, much quicker. The benefit, too, is the responsibility is placed back on the registrant. We have a lot of times where we've had architects tell us, you know what, my plans aren't fully uh, baked yet, but I know you're gonna do a review and tell me what I'm missing, so go ahead and, and review them. This makes them self-certify that those plans are done, correct, and ready to go. Uh, it, it puts some of that back on them. It, we will never miss a turnaround time with this program because we don't have a turnaround time. We're not, we're not doing a review, so it, it's, it's all back on, on the, on the applicant. And then the ICC certification um, is good because if we require that the engineers and architects have that ICC certification, the same as our plan reviewers, then we kind of have a, a foundation that we're all working from, a, a kind of a common understanding of how we're moving forward and what's, what's expected. So some of the challenges that we see of self-certification. Um, again, it's additional time for the building inspector. Our building inspectors are not trained to be plan reviewers. Um, kind of the way it works is you enter the, the profession as a building inspector, you do that for a while, then you become a plan reviewer, you sort of move up the, the, the uh, ladder. Um, we would need additional training for our, our building inspectors in order to, to handle that plan review. And what we would suggest is that they would be ICC certified, same as our plan reviewers, same as what we would require for the um, architects and engineers that are submitting them. Um, additional inspectors, so we did 51,398 building inspections last year. That's a building inspection, that's not a plan review and a building inspection. So now if we add a building inspection component or a plan review component to that, we're going to slow down the number of inspections that we're able to do at a given time. If you called in this morning by 5 a.m., we would have an inspector at your construction site today to do the, the inspection. If we have to push some of these out and do plan reviews in the field, chances are we're going to either drop service loads or increase um, staff in order to be able to handle those, those additional inspections. I mentioned that the um, building inspectors are not uh, plan reviewers, and because there's no plan review done up front, there's always that potential risk of missing some life safety things in the field. Um, we don't like to think of that, but it, there is a potential that is the less review you do prior to construction, the increase uh, of some, some things going wrong um, can occur. Sure. Uh, another challenge to the program would be if um, we did do any type of classes, then we've got additional staff time to administer and implement the program, hold the classes, keep the list of who's on, uh, who's on, who's off, who hasn't submitted their uh, insurance. Um, removal of applicants, we, we touched on that just a, sec a second ago. I think Phoenix has a three strike rule. If you're audited three times and you don't the plans that you have submitted do not meet those requirements, then you're removed from the um, program. Uh, it's very uncomfortable, obviously, to, to have somebody pay $1,500 for a program, go through it, and then tell them that they're no longer going to be part of your program. And then the DR approvals are a little different. Um, when you're looking at a set of construction drawings, you're looking at the details of the construction. Um, you're not necessarily looking at the way the building looks. So as, you, as we begin to look in the field, whether or not that building meets the DR approvals or not, that may be a little different because those are different details. So, and at that point in time, we're way down the road if we've got different materials on the building or different colors or some of those things. So presently what we do is we do a DR a, a, a approval review with the building plans so that we ensure that the plans meet what was approved by the design review board. So we sat down with two architects that you all might know. Um, Brian Johns and Brian Anderson are both local architects. Um, they're both on the design review board, or what was the design review board, now the planning commission. Um, Brian Anderson was actually the uh, chairman at, at the time when we spoke to him about this. Um, they both love the project, or the process in Phoenix. I think it's a great process. Um, they've only used it with TIs, though. They've never done any ground up buildings um, through that process. Um, they're the ones that, that gave us the, the turnaround times. They're seeing, Brian was, Johns was seeing five to seven days. Brian Anderson was seeing about a five day um, turnaround time through Phoenix to get the um, permits. Um, and neither one of them has used any of the other city 
cities around us, their, their, their self-certification programs. They've only done it through the city of Phoenix. So the options are on the next slide. Um, and again, they're just a, a place to start from and, and move forward with. Um, but we wanted to put something out there. Um, obviously, there's a, always a do-nothing option. So we'd stay with the current programs. Uh, there'd be no cost, the same review times that we have. Uh, we could expand the current one and done that we have, um, add some additional occupancy types, make it a little more robust. Um, and then the self-certification trial program. And I'll go over number two and three in a little more detail. With the um, current one and done, we'd expand it to, to all different um, TI. We'd want to we'd want to follow um, what we're currently doing, but expand it to other occupancy types. So start to pick up some of those hazardous or, or occupancy types that we're not currently doing. Um, the engineering and planning would still not be involved. Those approvals we would still want up front. Um, we would still do all the minor TIs at the counter the way we're doing them now. Uh, and then um, we would still self-certify after the first review through the, that eight-day uh, process. Um, there's no classes that we would run or hold. Uh, there's no decertification process that we would have to go through if somebody um, didn't comply. And on the second option, we think that we can, we can add to this, add to our current program, it, it, take in those extra occupancies and make it a little more robust without adding any additional staff or, or, or folks. We think we could probably right now handle, handle something like that. Option three is a self-certification trial program. So this is where we would um, jump in um, and do something very similar to the slide you saw that had all the other jurisdictions. What we would want to do is um, sort of mirror ours after theirs. Um, we'd like to keep it to, to tenant improvements again um, only, uh, that we had talked about the, um, you know, the factory, the storage, the mercantile, and the business. Um, things that are two-story or less um, in height. Um, we'd like to do TIs that are less than 25,000 square feet in area. Um, we would require the ICC certification then of the um, engineer or the architect. We wouldn't want to hold classes um, and, and try to take that on. We would rather them go through the ICC certification Does process. Do they already have that? No, they don't. And when we talk if to they work through Phoenix, they either have that or they have the Phoenix in, classes. The, um, if you're working through Phoenix, you probably just went to the Phoenix class. You haven't gone through the ICC. Other jurisdictions have required them to go through the is ICC it class. It is not. It's, it's a shorter, it's about a three-day class, I think, and the cost is considerably less. Would we allow someone to go to the Phoenix class and that would qualify? Well, and, and that's a good discussion because when you go to the Phoenix class, you're learning the Phoenix building codes and the Phoenix process. So. But you're also learning the ICC. I mean, there's some overlap. That's not argument. ICC, the Phoenix doesn't use the ICC certification in their program. I don't know. I mean, it's fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, five hundred to fifteen. And, and, and like I said, it depends on what you're getting self-certified for. And then every three years you have to renew that, which is one hundred and fifty dollars. So that's not that bad. Right. If we did the ICC certification, it would just be through ICC. They would they would handle all that for us, and that's the beauty is we don't then have to. Yeah, we don't have to hold classes. We don't spend staff time doing that. Um, yeah, no town classes, and then through our program, we would want to exclude any of the the hazardous things that that the other folks are doing. The commercial kitchens, the high piled storage, floodplain areas, some of some of those types of things. Um, now I have something else for you. Uh, one of the things I was asked to do was provide some um, staff accomplishments for the last year out of development services. There we go. So and it's, just, it's just a few. Um, and each group is by no way or means um, all-encompassing. Um, planning worked on some interactive maps, so now any citizen can go online, um, click the interactive map, look up where public hearings are at, and pull that information up. So there's a lot more uh, information. Um, it used to be a struggle for sign companies to come to town and, and figure out what plan they were under. Now it's all online. They can do the research beforehand. Makes their submittal and the, the turnaround time much quicker. Um, obviously, we combined planning commission and design review board. Um, we've brought several text amendments to you all, um, streamlining processes and, 
and uh, making changes to our code. And then the planning staff did 378 planning cases. And just to put a number to that, there's five planners. So that's, uh, in the last year, they were able to handle just, just that many. Uh, I mentioned we did 5,426 building and fire permits. Um, that's just non-residential. 1,827 single family permits and then 1,247 engineering permits um, are on top of that as well. Are we still from uh, residential? Are we still the no, we slid to about the third in the last nice. month. Yes, and and yeah. 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 And, and kind of what, <laughs> what we see is, is when land prices and costs change a little bit, the, it starts to spread out. So you'll see Queen Creek come up and Florence and but Surprise. We Yes, yes. Um, I mentioned we did 51,398 building inspections. Um, engineering inspections are completely different. We did 14,334 of those. Uh, we have a black backflow division of two people. I didn't know if you knew that or not. Um, uh, they did 740 inspections, and then there's tests required every year. They handled 8,963 tests. Two people? Yeah, so it's a third party does the test, but they enter it and take care of the program, and that's to ensure the safety of our water so that nothing is getting back into the water supply. Code compliance had 6,662 cases. You guys probably heard of about 6,000 of those. <laughs> um, they reviewed 1,494 business licenses. We issued, or did 550 new sign inspections, and then 1,852 signs were removed uh, that were illegal, most of them during the last political. <laughs> so. How many Jared's did we <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, that was just real high level on, on those, uh, the, the accomplishments, but wanted to share what the team was doing over the last year. So, so today we're going to talk about um, a couple of things uh, regarding the recent land sale. Um, we're looking for today for Council's input and direction on the sale of the property. Uh, that counts that the voters just recently passed and then we're going to stop there and get your input and then we're going to start up again and talk about the park development implementation strategy and what we're looking for there is basically uh, any discussion or direction on uh, the planned approach that we're going to present so under the sale of the property um, as you know the the we acquired the 272 acre park, basically 225 acres of easement, and we already own 47 acres. This is for your benefit in case you didn't know, which equals our new park, which is 272 acres. And what that did was allowed us to look at other properties that we've already acquired previously and be able to perhaps repurpose those properties uh, and reclassify them as surplus. And so that's what we did, and uh, part of the process of surplusing and, and uh, basically selling those properties, we have to go to the voters. The voters just recently in August did, did approve the sale of those properties. So um, right now it's about 138 acres combined. Um, some of the acreage from the original purchase has been used for um, some public works purposes for, um, I believe it's water or perhaps some wastewater um, purposes. Um, the appraised value as of the spring, we did this as uh, a pro part of the process to put it to the voters, uh, came in at, at about $30 million. That represents about, uh, we're gonna use these figures uh, just as high level figures, about $225,000 an acre. Um, what we purchased the property for was about $300,000 an acre. So that's, that's the difference, um, that we're about $75,000 an acre. And remember that these are the combined value. So um, one of the pieces of property up north is 60 acres and it appraised higher than the 80 acres down south. And so this is a combined value, which leads to a, a strategy um, in a future slide. If we were to sell the property, and council said, let's go sell the property today, it would still take about six months to sell it. And I put the process on the board 
um, on the PowerPoint. Um, I won't go through each step, but basically it's, it's a formalized process that's, that uh, we have to go through in order to sell the property. Um, there's a couple of different little nuances. We could um, perhaps bid it or do a public auction, but, but basically um, the important point for council is that even if we decided today to sell it and got that direction, it would still take six months. Now, some of the considerations that we're proposing and actually that we're monitoring as staff, um, and there might be other considerations that council may want us to, to weigh in on and factors that we want to also evaluate, uh, but they are land cost, the original land cost versus the market value today, the construction cost, and, and particularly construction cost escalation, and service level expectations from the community, um, for example, the vote that just just occurred, and um, you know how long before that would get stale, and then other funding options besides the sale of land in order to develop the park. So these are all considerations that we are looking at in determining this. So what I want to talk about is this nuance of the land cost versus market value and construction cost first. So basically, if you look at this chart, um, the green line represents the escalation annually compared to the previous year of the construction cost uh, increase. So even though it looks like a flat line, basically what this is telling us is every year it's gone up an average of 2.8 percent, about 3 percent, let's just call it 3 percent. Meanwhile, uh, the land, which is the other factor that we're weighing against, has been more volatile over the last, uh, since 2012. We have data from 2012. The average is 12 percent, but as you can see, uh, it's going to be, you know, we're not sure that we can rely on that versus a, a steady line increase of construction costs of 3 percent a year. What that means to us is that a $30 million project today, um, if we were to get the $30 million for the property and we were able to apply it to this model, that project of $30 million today in five years from now would be $35 million. So it will cost us $5 million more in five years for the same project that we might consider today. So, these are the influencing factors. We believe that construction costs are likely to escalate in the steady fashion and keep escalating in the steady fashion, while land appreciation is not as predictable. And so we need to make sure we're monitoring this on an ongoing basis. The gap between the original purchase price of the property versus the, the the current price now, whoops, I'm sorry, the current price now is to close that gap may take up to five years. And that's if everything is aligned the way we, we think it might be. We do believe that construction, that land value will escalate. What we want to monitor is, is it escalating faster or slower than construction costs? The next thing is uh, that we're also monitoring are the service level and citizen expectations. Obviously, this, this, this funding will be used to develop the regional park, and there's a high level of expectations to, to do that at some point in the near future or in the future. Um, we do have additional funds that are going to be needed. So the land sale is not the only pot of money would, that would be needed in order to finish the regional park. So um, in the next section, you'll hear about the SDF, but there's private-public partnerships, there's bonds, in addition to the land sale that will be necessary. And then we're looking, also looking at, is it more advantageous to sell the parcels individually or bundle them together? And so we're trying to look at that as a strategy, and uh, we've talked with economic development, and so we're still vetting that out. And then there's the current appraised value that we have, and that's always going to be different than the market value, meaning what somebody's willing to pay for a large piece of property in Gilbert, which there are not very many. 
And so um, we might be able to get a little bit more once we go out to bid and um, go through this process just to see what the market will yield. And of course, we might get a little bit less. But, but um, you know, we think that we what, what we do know is that we don't know what the market will yield. OK, that's what we do know. <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm to be quoted on that, I know. <laughs> So um, what we're, we're, we're proposing on doing is uh, monitor these key influencing factors that we just went over. We want to reappraise the property at some point um, in the near future. Uh, we may want to recommend to council to go ahead and issue this bid package to see what that market will bear. Um, that way we know what the property value really is. And then present any recommendations to council as we progress. I want to remind Council of the five key interests that we talked about at uh, the last Council meeting when we presented the conceptual design that got approved by Council and uh, that we're going to maximize our potential for partnerships and sponsorships on this project. Uh, we talked about um, constructions and operations, uh, basically the cost associated with those. We looked at the dirt removal issue. and. Um, the phasing and timing of sports fields, as um, Jared was just talking about, and then staffing levels. And we came up with a plan uh, to basically take a more comprehensive approach. Uh, rather than just focus everything on the sports field, we also have other, other acreage that we can focus on as well that would help us to be able to start to deliver uh, a number of different needs. So uh, today what I'm bringing back is the plan to do that and I'm looking for a council direction on that. Just a reminder, uh, the master plan says that we, we need about 10,070 uh, acres or so and basically uh, we have um, 605 develop acres now. The minimum need then is identified in the master plan would be 465 acres. Uh, a lot of other things that go into that but what we do have available for land is about 522 acres 80 of which is not in our control, meaning the greenfield buffer area. Um, the f so the park phasing approach, um, oh, yes. Where did you get your service? Remind me where those numbers come from. The, that number came from the Parks and Recreation Master Plan that was uh, adopted by Council as a recommended service level for our community based upon uh, uh, peer communities and anticipated need in our community. Do you remember reading that document? I have approved it. Then I, then I read the field to needs assessment, then I read a lot of things. <laughs> My brain hurts. So I've, I've given you a lot of stuff to read. <laughs> Good. And speaking of that, uh, since then, uh, we have done a field needs assessment, and as you alluded to, and so um, we'll be talking a little bit about that as well. But basically, the park phasing approach, um, develop phase one at the regional park, develop phase one at Rittenhouse, and then uh, start to aggressively look at these public-private partnerships, arrangements. And so those are, that's a three-prong three approach we want, to, we want to, to proceed on in order to deliver the park um, basically at these two locations. It will achieve a lot of different things, but that, that's what we're looking at. So just to remind you of uh, the park, uh, the big regional park, uh, some of the, a lot of the amenities that were in there, what we're looking at is just the phase one. And on the screen, you'll be able to see the, um, the phase one area and the amenities. So this would basically, um, and I know it's small to read, but I'll just read off a couple of the things. Uh, we'll have um, the irrigation lake and a walking path, pickleball, playground, ramadas, splash pad, tennis courts, volleyball court, and some, uh, some a little bit of other path around all those amenities. Uh, again, we, we, we built this uh, concept based upon delivering a park in the south part of Gilbert, um, utilizing SDF funds, and so uh, this particular project would be funded completely by SDF funds that we currently have available today. Then um, the Rittenhouse Basin, this is something you haven't seen yet. And so the Rittenhouse Basin, um, this was, and I want to just forewarn everybody that this is a high level conceptual design 
that we have not vetted out with the community or the sports leagues or the neighbors, uh, but basically uh, takes into account uh, the area that, that's been reserved for public safety facility. And so this was what it could look like. Uh, but we're proposing that um, phase one uh, might look like this. This would deliver the current field needs analysis, uh, fields that are identified today as a current need. And so um, basically it would be, uh, there would have to be an irrigation leak, uh, lake, there would be uh, softball fields, a playground, a ramada, and, um, and soccer, soccer fields. So uh, soccer and baseball fields. And this would, this would uh, basically meet the current needs. Um, the construction costs that we're estimating for this, you haven't seen this yet either, would be about 15.8 million with an operating subsidy of about $350,000 a year. And th that, um, the construction costs could also be paid with SDF funds that we also currently have available. Okay, so this, this project could be funded. The timing on this project would be um, on Gilbert Regional Park. Uh, it's in the, and this is for Council Member Taylor as well. Um, the, the design in the CIP is to begin July of 17. This is what the CIP has in it right now. And then uh, we estimate that the groundbreaking would be as early as September of 2018 with the ribbon cutting, uh, August of 2019. And then development of Rittenhouse Basin, it would take a little bit longer. We could start at the same time, uh, but because we haven't done any geotechnical work or uh, design analysis, uh, any outreach or anything like that, uh, we would have to um, basically work with the Flood Control District to get that approved. The conceptual design is already approved for the regional park with the Flood Control District, but this would require that extra outreach. So this one would be ribbon cutting about six months later. And then all the same while, we'd like to start these public-private arrangements and see if there's opportunity there to lower any of our costs that, we, that, that I propose today. The Heritage District is, a, is an area, obviously, that is known throughout Maricopa County and, and certainly um, more and more throughout the state of Arizona um, for sort of its vibrancy. Um, obviously, it's, it's clean and safe environment and um, some of the other things that uh, that certainly it's known for is um, is sort of a food destination um, as we meet with developers and talk with those that want to invest in the area um, some of the some of the concerns that they share with us are sort of the difference between sort of regulatory documents like the general plan the guidelines the heritage district guidelines etc versus um, things that are just that that are more um, guiding um, such as the um, the pathways project and perhaps some capital improvement plans and as we talk with those developers, they often they often ask us, well, um, what what is it that you need versus what is it that you want, and and that that helped us um, really begin to frame the the dialogue for today. Um, we, as you know, are engaged in a in a um, pretty extensive uh, public engagement process uh, to which um, we are meeting with uh, with eight eight different uh, subcategories um, to get feedback from the residents, from the stakeholders, from the merchants, from property owners, from developers, et cetera. Um, and the idea be behind those eight um, meetings are to help us prepare for a strategic plan to which we will write in calendar year 18. And so uh, today we're here to update and inform you about our efforts um, to uh, to gather input, stakeholder feedback, and then uh, ultimately come back to you as council with recommendations from those discussions. And so um, we will seek feedback, and from that feedback, we will bring forth recommendations to all of you. Um, but before we get into some of those specific categories, I wanted to briefly review what we've been doing over the last 18 months. 
And so as you can see on this board, we've been engaged um, with the community and with the, and with the stakeholders and the residents and the merchants, et cetera, since, since January of 2015, um, utilizing some consultants to come in and study the area and, uh, and generally um, make recommendations to the town. We then took those recommendations and again engaged the community, asked them about their thoughts and comments about these recommendations coming from the consultants. Um, and from that, it spawned a larger uh, community development effort uh, focused on, on gathering input and feedback. Um, and so, as you can see, over the 18 months, um, we've been engaging the community in various categories. We've um, surveyed the community and had a very, um, I, I would characterize it as a very positive response, pretty extensive, about 4,000 people uh, commented on their feedback, and that helped sort of guide and shape um, our perspective. And so um, with that, uh, we'd like to share um, some, of the, some of the ask, if you will, of today of, of all of you, and, and at the same time share with you um, some of the efforts that we're doing to engage the public. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jacob. Thanks, Dan. So the ask up front, so you're all aware of what we're going to be uh, talking about specifically over the next couple of minutes, is first to give direction to staff in preparing a land disposition and acquisition policy to help guide development in the Heritage District as we are working on acquiring parcels, disposing of parcels. There are additional guidelines that would be helpful for staff to maximize value of land parcels as we're both developing them and uh, acquiring them themselves. Uh, we're going to be asking for direction to confirm the proposed timeline for the next parking garage in the Heritage District. Uh, we're going to be asking for some direction to staff to bring forward a budget contingency request for the development of a wayfinding plan for the Heritage District, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, direction on pursuing a bike share agreement uh, and looking for uh, bringing in kiosks uh, into the Heritage District and other appropriate locations throughout the town. And finally, to bring forward an FY18 budget request for the development of the uh, update for the redevelopment plan itself, uh, which will come out of some of the work that we're doing here. So first off, uh, to recap, there are eight areas of focus that all lead into the final uh, update of the redevelopment plan, as Dan mentioned. Uh, we're talking about land development, operations and maintenance costs, both what we're paying today as well as looking at what those are going to look like in the future. Looking at par uh, parking and traffic circulation, wayfinding, waste <coughs> management, uh, connectivity, special events and administrative use permits, as well as looking at the role of arts uh, in the Heritage District. First point, so when it comes to land development, the overall goal that we're trying to achieve here is maximizing value, and that's talking about value when it comes to enhancing the Heritage District, uh, return on investment, as well as making sure that as the Heritage District builds out, that we're keeping an eye on that, what that overall vision looks like so that the development is occurring in a way that keeps uh, uh, the overall consistency with the plan as it's been developed to date. Um, so in terms of what's next, we're looking to d draft a development policy that's going to help provide further guidelines that will assist staff as they are going on and acquiring and developing parcels of land to maximize that value. We will be bringing forward recommendations for the development of certain town-owned properties, as well as continuing to target acquisition of key parcels of land to try to assemble uh, larger tracts of land that can be used for uh, maximizing development and bringing in the kinds of development that we're looking for. For parking, uh, we've mentioned we have the second parking garage that is coming uh, hopefully online within the next couple of years. And we've developed a timeline. I just want to walk you through that. We know that, that there is greater demand for parking both now and coming into the future with the new development that we've got coming online. Uh, so right now our timeline looks like uh, developing the master plan. We hope to have that completed by March of 17. The uh, procurement and approvals by April, design finished by November 17. Uh, construction would then occur through uh, December through September of 18 with the ultimate uh, goal of having that completed in September of 2018. We're trying to, to tailor that into coming development that's, that's hopefully going to come to fruition here in the next uh, few months as we work on development agreements. Uh, and that timeline is hopefully going to help support that as well as provide the added capacity that we need as other restaurants are coming online in this area. Uh, wayfinding, the goal here of course is to promote and highlight the different amenities that we have in the Heritage District. It helps create a sense of place, uh, creates a brand and helps ensure that uh, folks can find their way around to get to those businesses and, and that we're trying to highlight here. The ask here again is the development of a wayfinding plan that can be used to help highlight these amenities. Uh, legalities and trying to work through those things are all part of that plan and that's something that we need some additional uh, help on. One of the other principles that we've been trying to draw into this presentation itself 
is answering the question of what's needed to ensure that there's no bottlenecks to the overall development in the Heritage District. We don't want to find ourselves in a position where some particular element of development is being hindered because we haven't addressed all the different components that we're trying to hit. Wayfinding is one of those things that continues to come up when we have a lot of interest by our merchants in better coming up with a plan to help promote the Heritage District. So this is one of those things that we're trying to get moving on so that it's in place and ready to go so that we can get some more signage up and, and running in the near future. Uh, connectivity. We want to make the Heritage District as pedestrian and bicycle friendly as possible. There's a lot of opportunities that are out there now. We want to take advantage of those and, uh, and try to get more folks down here. We've got, we've got the canal, we've got trails that can tie in here. There's a lot of opportunities to use that as a way to enhance vibrancy and get folks out of their cars and out uh, visiting our local businesses. So would the ask here again is to conduct a feasibility study and that would allow us to look at uh, the viability of bringing in bicycle kiosks and getting those installed in the downtown. And we would also use that to, as a springboard to look at other appropriate town locations for those. Uh, oh, and also is to reevaluate the findings from the Heritage District Pedestrian Pathway Improvement Project. That's something that's been ongoing for a number of years in the past. We want to be able to update that, reevaluate those findings, and see how those tie into a pathway strategy for the east side of Gilbert Road. Uh, waste management. Uh, we're looking to improve how we manage waste in the Heritage District to uh, improve the aesthetics, uh, reduce problems with odors, and make sure that we've got the level of service available to service uh, the growing businesses that are downtown. And we've had a number of meetings with stakeholders uh, talking about this issue, and we'll be bringing forward some recommendations on that. Um, we're going to hopefully have those ready in the next couple of months to bring to a study session, and then we can begin to action some of those solutions that have been developed to date. Um, all of these efforts on these eight different areas, as we mentioned at the top of this presentation, are all going to be feeding into the redevelopment plan as that occurs in 2018. So a number of the policy decisions and changes and new ideas that have come forward, we hope to be able to incorporate into that document. And in order to do so, we would like direction to prepare a FY18 budget request for those professional services to allow us to assemble all of that together in a plan that will then be adopted in 2018, which as a reminder is a requirement. Uh, in a redevelopment area, you need a plan updated every 10 years, and so that the last time it was done it was in 2018. So the direction sought is a recap. Every 10. Every 10. Did I say? I was in 91, I believe, was the first plan. It, it got done, it, it's been updated uh, three times now. So the, the second update occurred bef prior to 10 years, and then uh, we're now back on the 10-year schedule. So the direction side again is the preparation of a land disposition and acquisition policy. And that again is something that would come to council for consideration, but that would allow us to try to consider all of the different factors in land development and get those in a policy that can provide that direction to staff as they bring forward uh, opportunities for both acquisition and disposition of, of lands. Uh, confirmation of the parking garage timeline, uh, the contingency request for the wayfinding plan, uh, pursuing an agreement for a bike share program, looking at the feasibility of that, as well as an FY18 budget request for professional services to update the redevelopment plan in 2018. So our purpose of being before you today is to seek your direction to initiate an amendment to the land development code. To give you a little background, we have had a significant amount of commercial growth and we have put the infrastructure in place to support that growth, but we also realize that there is a significant need to re-examine the land development code for our residential so that homeowners can maximize their home values, so that we can maximize the opportunities for multifamily development, and so that we can really have a, a wide array of offerings within, uh, within residential. Okay, so for the purpose of today's discussion, we're gonna look at three areas. We'll look at Lacey Tract, which is currently zoned SF6. We'll look at multi, uh, multifamily low up in the eastern portion of the district, and we'll look at the southeast, which is zoned SF7. So currently, looking at Lacey Tract, we have a resident who is here. Uh, we, this is the area that we've received the most variances, uh, requests for variances um, in the uh, residential area in the Heritage District. And Doralise was nice enough to provide us with some photos of Lacey Tract just to give you an idea of the type of product that's in the area. 
So you can see there are, you know, the smaller kind of cottage style um, bungalow type homes. And the big challenge that these residents face is uh, a few things with the current zoning. Uh, the setbacks are challenging for them. The um, 45 and 40 percent uh, ability to um, Thank you, lot coverage. <laughs> Thank you, lot coverage. Um, it does not allow for a second dwelling or guest unit, so all of these challenges have uh, required that they come before us for variances. So Linda has uh, prepared some ideas, and by no means are these the final, uh, the final points that we will use, but these are just some ideas as we go through this process of amending the land development code. Good afternoon. So. This slide talks about introducing a new zoning district and also a zoning district that is specific to the Heritage District. So single family detached is an existing zoning district and we would create HD. So most of the standards would be the same. However, some of them would change and some of them that would change would allow a second dwelling unit or a guest quarter either attached or detached to the home or the garage. Also, we believe that the true village feel needs to densify. Folks don't have swimming pools behind their little bungalows. This is an urban environment. They walk to the park, they use the trails, they, they gather at the places of the restaurants and behind restaurants and, and even use the alleys to walk and talk and exercise. So um, these are things that we think about that we would need to develop new standards for single family detached including um, may be prohibiting a three-story with SFD as SFD now allows three-story. In the district, the bungalow style is probably more than adequate to be two-story. And also, what is very unique about our downtown are two other factors for the SFD zoning district. And that is the town did go through and modify the streetscape. So there's detached sidewalks, grass, and trees. So the property line is behind sidewalk. So there is already a good distance between back a curb to the property line and then a 20-foot uh, front, front yard setback, which doesn't allow the homeowner to utilize their property uh, to maximize front porches and all those kinds of things. So that's one of the uh, things that we would like to look at uniquely for the village center. Now MFL is a zoning district that allows densities between 8 and 14. And typically when you think of MFL in our community we see the duplex or the townhouse type project either in a condo plat or a a townhouse plat. Here it is difficult to build this type of density on small lots. 25 foot front, 25 foot rear setbacks almost obliterates small parcels. You cannot even build on them. So we need to, with variances and things like that for this unique area, you can get through the process. But we're trying to make it buildable from the time that you come in and are interested. We've had to say no to folks who come to us who want to build and they don't have the time to go through rezonings or variances. So the new multifamily low HD zoning district would remove some of these setbacks requirements that um, are onerous and uh, size of the lots and also we need to dive into what other cities are doing with this type of village for parking both on-site and off-site. So there's a good range of standards we need to look at to make multifamily village lifestyle and I think we have a visual for you. So here's a visual that could not be built in Gilbert today because you would need 25 feet back a sidewalk and in Gilbert with the also the requirement of 45 percent common open space in addition to 60 square feet per unit you would not be able to build in our community on the east side of Gilbert Road. So we are working with the builder now who's doing a fantastic job utilizing alley access and using the front yard for the private open space. He does need a couple of variances. It's going to happen. It's going to be a beautiful project. But those are the types of visuals that lead us to develop new standards to get that. So it would be multifamily HD. And then what I think no one has tapped yet, and I went through it on my way here today, is this little corner that's um, an interesting little pocket of single family detached SF7 
and it's buffered in its own little cul-de-sac world with the railroad and then the duplex along Elliott Road. These homes are slump block and they're brick. Some have been covered with stucco. And if you drive through, you will also see that a few of them have been upgraded lately and they're quaint and very cute. So in order for this part of the community to reinvest and enhance values in the district, same concepts. Bring some of the buildable porches and extensions and whatnot closer to the street, create that community gathering, allow more lot coverage so that they can build those guest quarters and second dwelling units, and then also modify and upgrade our design guidelines to show this lifestyle that is very doable in this little pocket. So some of the things that we're using now, so development continues, is overlays for the Heritage District, administrative relief, and variances, sometimes even a rezoning with, through a PAD so that you can uh, vary those standards. What we're asking for is that we put together a schedule to modify these three zoning districts for the downtown with stakeholder input from the folks who live here, of course, the Redevelopment Commission need, need to, of course, also work with the Planning Commission ultimate, ultimately to you um, for your review and um, approval. That would take about seven months. Of course, it could be quicker, but we think that the input from the residents um, in this area is valuable. It's really exciting to be here again this year uh, to talk to you about uh, capital improvement and our program that we run over on Muni 2, where sometimes you don't see us, but I know you see everything that goes on on the street. Uh, I wanted to um, let you know my name is Kristen Myers, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I am the interim CIP manager. I've been in this role since August 1st, so less than 60 days. Uh, in this time, um, I've learned a great deal about really what goes on uh, behind the scenes with capital <coughs> improvement. I thought I knew. Um, I've been doing project management for some time, but in the town of Gilbert, our um, CIP team and program is very robust. It really is from a planning type of group all the way to assistance with maintenance and operations uh, for some of our operating groups. So there, there's just a vastness that goes on. So today, what we wanted to talk to you about is uh, CIP and some things that, that we do in that. Uh, I'm going to be speaking for the majority of it. Um, the end of the um, program, Kelly Post will come in and kind of give some information on CIP and how it works from the budgetary and financial side of the house. All right. So, my first <laughs> week is... <laughs> I was given. <laughs> yes, I so my first week as an RM, I was given the assignment by our illustrative executive producers that I needed to get in front of a council retreat and bust some myths that they've received from constituents, from stakeholders, from internal parties on what goes on in CIP and why it is the way it is. Uh, so uh, I am here to kind of go through some of these myths that were brought to me and uh, really start to spell out what the CIP process is, what it means, and how you can play a more active role in the next retreat session. So, all right, so what I have learned since I have been here, when I first got here, I had to read this book, and it's called The Project Delivery Manual. Our team back there, and what started with Eliana Hayes, our, our last CIP manager, is they realized that they really needed to be some sort of operating procedure because capital improvement is very complex, project ma management is very complex. So they thought if we have this book that kind of outlines all of the steps that it takes, then we can really start to evaluate a process, um, really look at the flow, are we all lock in step, and do the operating groups all the way to management understand what it takes to get through the process. So when I sat down at my desk, I read over 200 plus pages of um, what goes on. That included um, dialogue, attachments, checklists, you name it, flowcharts. They have flowcharts beyond flowcharts. <laughs> but what I learned from that is that it is a step. Everything is a process. Everything has a timeline. Everything has a reason from A to Z. 
So today what we're going to cover, we're going to talk about, we're just going to do a quick overview of the development process before we get into busting the myths. I was given two myths that uh, I want to go into in depth, and hopefully by the end of this you'll, you'll say that we did bust them. And then what we're going to do at the end is we're going to come back and we're going to start talking if you have any questions about what we talked about today. And then our ask for you is to talk about coming back to you in February at the Spring Retreat, which I know Kelly touched on earlier, to talk about the FY18 CIP prioritization. Give us more of an opportunity for dialogue to understand why things were brought into the FY18 program that are there, and then to get your feedback before we bring the draft back to you in May and then um, the final in June for adoption. So do a brief overview. So who's involved in the process? Um, I know it's Team Gilbert now, which is really exciting. <coughs> they added this logo and I saw it yesterday and I thought that was really great. This is a really complex, everyone type of involvement. So back there, are my green, my green heads, and I'll introduce them later. Uh, I've had them here for a reason, because I only know so much about this, and they're, they're my experts. So they're hey, so lovely. Recruited. Uh, and, and then, so it's that team kind of starts at, at the top, but then underneath, we have basically everyone in Gilbert. We touch every single operating group from fire department to the police to courts to our, our roadways that you drive on every day to development services. We are, we are talking to everyone from water to wastewater. Uh, it's a very exciting, very technical uh, division, and, and which really makes it, it's really kind of a, it's an honor to be a part of it because sometimes I have typically only worked in the transportation arena. But when you get into CIP, you get to see all of these amazing operating groups and everything that goes on in the town, and we're all here to help them build and maintain those. Okay, so this is one of the flow charts, one of many, from um, our project delivery manual. And this really just starts to show kind of what the evolution of a project is, but it's only a very small portion of what happens from a planning perspective all the way down to, you guys see it in the 10 years CIP uh, for adoption. We're going to dive into this a little bit more, but first we want to talk about myth number one. So the myth that was brought to my attention was that CIP is a black hole. Things just go in it, you don't understand why they're there, and you guys don't understand why they're there. I know you and I have had a couple talks about that. <laughs> so today what we want to do... I said it was a black hole. Well, <laughs> well, you know, you've never said it. I've heard it's been a black hole. So Sometimes today what I want to do is... Stay in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> Let them escape from a black hole. Oh, yeah, shoot. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the purpose of uh, the CIP development process really uh, has, a, has a couple components, and you'll see this really from um, any <coughs> of private development to where I was at the state. The, CIA, the uh, improvement program really follows some basic uh, goals. So really want to look at what's priority on repair and replacement of in infrastructure. Um, you want to have a level of certainty of the project location. When we put something in the CIP, we don't want to say we just want one mile, let's say, of Val Vista, when really five miles maybe of Val Vista needs to be reconstructed. There has to be that level of certain, cert certainty, and that comes from good planning. Um, also, a uh, timing of the project has really got to be a goal of the CIP. We do understand that sometimes the timing evolves with maybe changes in the climate, changes in development and what's going on, but you have to, you have to understand what the needs are especially from maybe even a repair that might need to be, might need to happen on a roadway. Why spend money on pavement preservation when maybe in a couple of years you have to go in and, and uh, widen that roadway anyway? So there's always kind of a balance and a review of that. Also, you have to look at um, economical standpoint. How, when can you pay for it? Do you have like maybe a grant coming up that only gives you so many years to, to build it? Uh, certain things like that we all take into account. Um, also, very important is our public and stakeholder input. Uh, we get that from a planning <coughs> perspective, we get it from the design perspective, and we also go back and get feedback from a construction perspective. Also, is the balance of financial resources, and Kelly will touch more on that at the end. But that's not only in dollars. Sometimes we always think about how do we pay for things and when can we pay. We also, in CIP, have to look at 
What are our staff resources? Do we have the capacity to really make this a effective project? Because if you're being pulled too thin, sometimes you overlook things. So that also has to be taken into account as we're developing the program. So just from a high level right now, we really start from the pre-designed development of a project proposal. And we're going to go in a little bit more detail on that. So this is really when we start getting into the development of the uh, capital <coughs> improvement program. Next, we really will start to dive into project estimating. Uh, project considerations, that's like when everybody's in the swimming pool and everybody starts to see who, who's going to win in the swimming race. And then once we know what we're going to do, it's implementation and we start, we start working on our projects. So let's talk about the development of the project proposal. So um, we'll kind of go into some high level planning documents, some that you're familiar with. I know we talked about some last year at Council Retreat. Uh, versus what we, we like to call our master plan. For where I um, work in my operating group, that's our transportation master plan, which I know you are all very familiar with and were a part of it when we were putting it together. That really kind of sets the strategy for maybe that operating group. We also, um, this year, will be doing a water resources master plan. That's gonna start to shape what's needed in the future from a water resources standpoint. Uh, we have um, other master plans. Our fire stations were master planned out on what, what the build was going to be and the priorities on when those were. Also, um, another planning document is a feasibility study. We talked about this last year when we were talking about the Lindsay 202 TI. That started with a feasibility study that was done by the Maricopa Association of Governments. And what those studies look at is, this, is this even feasible? Are there too many constraints? Is it really one of those areas that there's going to be a fatal flaw? Let's really identify those now so we don't, we don't waste money in the future to really dive in deeper. <coughs> Another one um, that, it, that we have is what's called the design concept report. This is kind of the third tier in, a, in the planning phase. We come with that big master plan that's kind of your strategic. You can start looking at projects from that master plan to see if they're feasible. From there, you can really then, if it's feasible, let's dig in deeper from a design concept level and let's see what the true need is. We're doing that right now. We have two projects in our transportation and our street program. They really need to have more of a refined um, design concept look at them because there's a lot of constraints in the area, kind of going back to that feasibility, but we do know there's a need. So what we're doing is we're gonna to start to evaluate them from a high level, kind of get some structure on, and, and I'm gonna go maybe to a Gilbert and Elliott intersection. We know that there's a lot going on there. We know there's a need to improve that intersection, but we need to have a better level of understanding what the short term need is and what the <coughs> long term. And that's what the design concept report really helps us identify. You all know we're doing one for the Lindsay 202, but I wanted you to know that we also do it for our smaller projects. It's not a lot of money, but it gives us a better plan of attack. And when we come to you, you understand the priorities and why they were set that way. All of this is kind of what happens in the operating groups. Some, a lot of times CIP is involved in assisting the operating groups through these plans. But once these plans are complete and there's an idea of strategy, we go down into what's called a project Question. And this is really our kickoff in the capital improvement program development process that really brings the capital uh, managers in to really start working with our operating groups to talk about um, the true, you know, what are the um, components of the, of the project, what's the timing, what's the reasoning from the operational standpoint. So I should have handed this out earlier. I apologize. But so this is, um, this is called the project question. And a lot of times um, when you guys see our capital improvement program or our plan that comes to you at council, you don't, you don't get the opportunity to see all of the background that goes into it. This is, this is a very detailed um, item that we, we have a kickoff meeting at the beginning of August. And so you'll see the sheets. And on the um, top of the sheet, they have to come to us with a project description. And that project description really has to be detailed enough for us to understand what the components of the project are. Um, if uh, we're doing uh, you know, uh, maybe a new water treatment plant, what is, what is the uh, need for that? What is the um, ultimate footprint? When's the ultimate build out? 
All of that needs to really be vetted in the project description so we have an understanding. There's a financial interpretation, and that really comes back to what Kelly's going to talk about of how does budget fit into that and how, how can they deal with us, maybe certain funding sources that I might need, and that kind of comes back to the scope to understand what those components are. Then um, we have in the, the for your front page, you have a couple different areas, and that first one is the kind of goes into really the design to right away to construction. Those are the components that are in there and we really start to <coughs> identify what that, the funding need is in those years. And then another thing that we do right in is with the operating group is an expectation for them to know once it's built, what is your operation and maintenance uh, for that so that our budget um, department has a good idea of kind of long range funding needs. Even though once it's built, it's gonna be taken out of capital, this starts to give them a sense of the need in the future. So what I'd like you to turn to is that the back page. And this is really where the heart and soul of the project is. And sometimes it's as good as you write in there and the information that you bring. But what we wanna know from our operating groups is assumptions. We wanna know your purpose. Another thing we need to know, which is critical and sometimes can be missed, is who are your stakeholders. If it's a small, we're just going to put a new curb ramp in, you know, we're not going to spend the money on lots of public meetings and all, you know, that, that type of outreach. But if we do have a lot of stakeholders, that really may play into maybe, a, you know, there's a reason why we have such a high budget on public outreach. And we're able then to convey to you on the need based on what we received input on these sheets. Another thing with stakeholders, which really starts to come out, is um, if we know that there's a lot of land. Um, maybe, like, I've worked on projects, not in Gilbert, but state trust land. If you know that state trust is gonna be one of your uh, uh, stakeholders, you all, you know from a money standpoint, it's gonna be expensive, and also it's gonna be a scheduling conflict. So this is really critical for us to really understand the effort, the location, um, and then we always like to know where did this, why do you need this project? Where did it come from? Because it helps us to reference uh, what items, uh, you know, what was the basis and the criteria that you even brought this forward to the group. Okay, so we get the sheets from the operating group. We have them in, and we're working on them. Right now, this is happening behind the scenes over in Muni 2. So we have these sheets. Our operating group has filled them out. They give them to their project managers, and then we go behind the curtain. And what happens behind the curtain is it's, it's kind of magic. So the team takes all this information that they've received in those project sheets, and they utilize uh, estimating, because we really understand how important estimating is to anything in life. Estimation, understanding what your budgets are, wonder, understanding what you can spend, understanding your schedule of when you're gonna have that budget. All of that is so very important. And the guys and girls back there, they do a great job. A lot of them have just technical know of what things cost and are able from past experience, looking at other projects, looking at the components of those. They can sometimes utilize their, their own personal um, background. But then we also have a team of amazing consultants that work for us on our on-call. When we get into really complex projects, we, we do try to utilize our consultant partners out there because they've sometimes seen these projects in different uh, local areas, can come in with kind of what is currently going on, is there a new technology and all of that. And we get estimate, estimation from that, um, which I'll show you one of the sheets that we have. So this is what we have in our, in our background. Um, as we're working on this estimation, this is on Jermaine Gilberto Val Vista. I know you guys are all familiar with that. That is actually going to kick off here really quick with uh, design. But what, it's a little fuzzy and I apologize. But this originated back in 2014. We call it validation. So they knew this was going to be a complex, pretty big project. So we actually worked with one of our consultants named TriStar, who went through and really helped us define what the, um, when it says A need, that's your design component. We talk about CM, which is construction management. Are we gonna need somebody external to really be out in the field on our behalf? Because we can't be everywhere all the time to watch construction. And also, are they gonna be uh, needed in meetings with us to kind of assist as we work with the designers? There's also PM, which is project management. With the construction manager in the field, 
We also sometimes need a project manager on our behalf, just depending on what type of model we're using to construct the project. Sometimes it's a um, construction manager at risk. There are different um, modes that you need a higher level of a project management support. So that gets accounted for. Land, you know, if we have any takes right of way. Uh, construction is a, I know, that's, that's an easy one. Utilities, do we have RWCE that we're working with? Do we have to take that into account from a cost standpoint, but also a timing standpoint? Um, appraisals, uh, permits, sometimes if, we're, if we don't really look at that, we can miss some big items like maybe SRP. Maybe we need a permit from them that, that's captured in there. And then um, some other ancillary items. After that, once we kind of know, and I'll, I'll go back to, to this, so this was validated in 2014, but the next year, because we knew that this was a complex project and things are kind of changing a little bit of the footprint, we needed to um, take the footprint out a little bit farther and identify some new needs, and that kind of came from what's going on with the 202 and all that. We had another validation. So every year, we're kind of constantly updating. We have to take an in inflation rate. We really have to understand, is there a new developer that came in that built maybe a section of it? Well, then we can scale back our scope of work. There's always kind of a revalidation that goes on. So with that, once we kind of understand the landscape, we have the document, the project request sheets, we've gone through our estimations, we can really start to define a schedule. The schedule may not be based in years, but it definitely is based in duration. And with those durations, we can start to work with budget to start to define where does this best fit in the model. All right. So we've done our estimating. So everybody's got, uh, everybody's there. They're in the pool. We have to start to figure out in this competition who rises to the top. So what I'm going to talk about, which I'm most familiar with, is the transportation master plan priority example. So we have lots of roads that need either widening, fixing, intersections, and all of that. But everything can't happen at once. We don't have the money to do it all at once, but we also don't have the resources to do everything at once. And it wouldn't be good from a traffic uh, management standpoint. So what we have to do is we have to look at these criteria. And this criteria came out of public process. It came out input from you, and it came out from our, our internal stakeholders that really needed to, we all needed to be on the same page on how we were going to prioritize these. So just quickly, we'll just go over some safety always number one. If we're finding that we're having fatalities, we're going to we're going to try to deal with that one first. Uh, and if it's if it's fatalities based on uh, items that we can mitigate. Uh, internal, um, if we have any in internal governmental agreements, um, maybe with Mesa, maybe there's an expectation on baseline road. Sorry to always go back to roadway, but that's where my head goes. Um, <laughs> compatibility with existing plans. Um, maybe in our water master plan, maybe they're going to go in and need to do the, this big expansion or uh, rehab of the water line. Well, then it would make sense for us if they're going to rip out the road. Let's just let's just redo the road now instead of coming back twice. Okay, so we've looked at it from the operation standpoint. Well, then all of us operating groups go into this bigger bucket, this bigger swimming pool, and now we're competing with operational budgets. We're competing with how many staff are we going to, and then we need to build things. So that comes into a higher priority. Uh, it, it's kind of what we would call, um, and Kelly, you gave me the name, the litmus test. And so um, this is really the litmus, litmus test to the executive team that really shows how do things um, fall out between everybody's needs. And these are the four um, priorities that they look at, safety, livability, cost, effective, cost effectiveness, community support, and urgency. And these every couple years are reevaluated to make sure that we're still utilizing the same priorities for the changes that happen at Gilbert. All right, so just, uh, I know the slide is small, I just kind of wanted to show you how, how many steps and layers go into the development process. We start on August 1st, that's our kickoff meeting, that's when everybody gets their sheets and they have an expectation to get things back. Uh, they need to come back and have everything to us on September 1st so that we can start having meetings with them and, and really identify with the operating groups what they were needing. Sometimes they don't understand what we're building, so it takes some, some discussions behind the scenes. We do that until the end of October. After October, it goes into um, budget, where budget starts to look at what we have uh, from that perspective. 
goes over to the executive team, to the directors, then they start to shake out those, those four priorities on who's rising to the top. And then we get down and we start to re, we start to validate, we start to look at the, you know, what are the constraints and the funding sources, and Kelly will get deeper into that. But all of this happens from August 1st until you adopt it in June. And then we go on vacation, and then it starts to get <laughs> August 1st. Okay, myth number two. The other myth that was brought to my attention was if it's in the plan, in that year, I have to spend the money. Sometimes, yes, based on those priorities, we do. But there, this is also a planning document. So I wanted to kind of, um, kind of identify the three components to the CIP, just to help you understand that because we have it in there, it's a tool for us from a planning perspective. There are really three essential components. This is true with any type of capital improvement plan. You start with your long range plan, and we'll go back. That, that can be anywhere from general plan to a strategic plan. Then you have your capital improvement program, which is your two to 10 year. So your longer range, you won't always see in that capital improvement that you have, but you knew, know that there's all of these master plans that happen above that, that will really are long range. Capital improvement, two to 10, and your, then your capital budget, which is your one year. So long range planning here uh, is really to identify what are the needs and resources that we're just trying to achieve in the short term and the long term. We're always trying to kind of look at that 25 year horizon on, on what's going to be the best for the town, especially now that we know we're going to eventually get to build out. We're going to really have to start to evaluate maybe different differences on what we need from maybe pavement or, you know, with our long range infrastructure plan and all of that. So that's our um, long range to 25. Then you're familiar with the capital improvement program, and I apologize, Kelly, I could not put the new one in. So this is last year's, but I know we do have the new one, and it's beautiful. Uh, but really, from this, this plan is really the two to 10 year that we're looking at. And this is when we start to implement those projects that are in our strategic plans for operating groups. It's our roadmap that kind of takes us um, into, into the future to really identify where are we going from here? What, even for what we're looking at with what needs to be built, what do we need for staff? What do we need to do from a resource standpoint? It's also our planning document. Every year, it's a new year. And so we have to evaluate, are these, are these projects that we have in here still appropriate? And it kind of helps us with dialogue with the operating groups. Sometimes they may not even know they had a project in there in the six to 10 year. It's for us then to kind of communicate with them, hey, reevaluate this. Are you sure this is when you need it? And then we get to the capital budget. And this is their one year budget that you approve. Um, this is the one um, that we are fiscally constrained. It's been supported by public, it's been supported by council and management. And it is really prioritized based on that need in that year and what resources we, we can do with that. And this is also the one that uh, we're legally uh, bound with. All right, just a quick, just to kind of show you um, from a planning perspective that even though it's in the plan, we are always evaluating it and we're not always committed in the year that we have it. I go back to Cooley Station and our well uh, that was WA027. Um, this was planned back in the early 2000s. Um, we knew that when things were robust and there was lots of build going on, this was, there was a real potential for this to become dense quick. And so with that, people need water. But then, unfortunately, we had the recession. 2008 hit, the demand wasn't there, we had the infrastructure laid down, we were already building, we were building out the roads, we were doing that, and we didn't get the development that we had anticipated um, in, in the you know, 2010, 2014 arena. But what happened was we knew eventually something's gonna happen out there. There's always, there's, there's gonna be a need eventually. So what we did is we keep this well in place in our planning document. We have it out in the six to 10 year. So we're always reevaluating based on what we hear from development services. Maybe all of a sudden a new subdivision is just gonna come plunking in like right now. There's always that, that discussion. So Jessica may not be in her position in maybe three years, but maybe there's a new water manager. We, we have that document there to just kind of as an FYI, let's keep reevaluating this. 
And that, that is really what this two to 10 year planning uh, I, is for this CIP program. All right, and with that, I will pass it off to Kelly to kind of go in detail on what the financial process is for management sites. Thanks, Kristen. So as Kristen's mentioned, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. You've got that August, September, October timeframe when they're getting scopes, they're doing estimating of the projects, making sure that all the departments have that input. We get into the October timeframe, they're checking priority projects against each other, we're checking timing, looking at how the projects overlap. Um, and this is where a lot of Mark's spatial is really helpful, is that part when we're saying, is this making sense and where we have them plugged in. When we get into the November timeframe, we're looking at funding and trying to slot in, do we have enough money to do these things? One of the key parts of the funding that we're looking at are what are the available funding sources. With CIP Group, there can be multiple funding sources on any particular given project, and they all have different restrictions. And we do work to do the most restricted funding first, but we are trying, we're working with system development fees. Is it truly growth related? There are projects that are only partially growth related, like our fire station seven. It was a move and an expansion. So the expansion part was growth related. We use SDF funds on that, but the rest had to be funded another way. So we're balancing those types of things. We're looking at, um, can we use the MAG funding for projects. The developers contributed to a project in the past that we need to make sure that that contribution gets applied to the project, or is this a general fund project where there's not another opportunity? We also look at the bond funding projects. Bond funding, we try and minimize as much as we can, but sometimes general fund does not have the capacity to do it when it's not the most logical source. When we have bond funding, we try and combine them together because once we get the funding, we need to spend it in a three to five three to five year time period is ideal. And so I'll try and group projects together and say if we do bond funding here, then we can do bonds and then we can go back to using some general fund or other sources. It's really like a ballet trying to get everything to fit together and all of the pieces working together so we can fund the projects. Sometimes we'll go back to the operating groups or back to the CIP groups and say, hey, we're having trouble finding funding in these years. Is it possible that we could move them out into some later years or move them up into years um, for example, working with Rod on some of the parks projects, I said, Rod, I've got some uh, SDF funding, it's got some time frames, we've got to use it by 2020, what can we do on the projects to get those happening ahead of time and move those projects to any And so we're working back and forth. Then we go into the uh, January time frame and the exec team group gets together and talks about uh, priority and then we were looking at having the City Council come together in February time frame. We also have our external stakeholder meeting in that February time frame, and then we start into the budget process. Uh, as we move on, right there. With the financial process, we do have year one is funded. It is adopted with the uh, budget, and it has that official vote, so the funding is set aside for that year. But we have years two through 10, which are for planning purposes. Sometimes you say, why would we have those out there? Why do we worry about planning purposes? But Chris has gone over a lot of the really good reasons on the operational side why we would have that. We also need it on funding side, because when we go out and do the system development, these studies, the planning period is 10 years. And so we look at what growth-related projects we have and are planning for over the next 10 years and divide it up per unit, and that's how we assess our development fees. So we have to have that information together and as accurate as possible in order for us to get a good, accurate um, fee developed for our system development fees. We also need it for a lot of grant funding that we apply for. Our MAG, our ALCP, our aesthetics funding, so those programs are looking out five, 10, and 20 years. And so in order for us to get plugged in on their long-term scale to get funding from those sources, they need to have confidence in our documents and we need to have confidence in the projects that we have moving forward so that we can get plugged in and that they feel good about slotting us in for funding what we want to accomplish. And so all of those things come together for the purpose and really that value of having this long-term planning document with um, a great amount of work that goes into all of that. Back to this. This isn't a black hole that things just go in and there's no reason behind it. It's there, a curtain. 
It's a curtain. <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy. There's a guy. Yeah. The behind that curtain is very transparent. <laughs> in the year that we have it in, that we have to spend it in that year. We're always evaluating, reevaluating, talking, and uh, really working with all of our partners to make sure that what we have in the CIP program, we can validate to you, we can give you all of the good feedback and information so you understand the why. So with that, I uh, <coughs> wanted to talk about our ask. And I've already, I saw that you guys had talked about that this morning with Kelly. But we really want to confirm that this might meet some of the needs that you have from a council perspective to understand our CIP program and what we're going to be bringing to you as a draft in April and May. So what we were hoping is, with that long process that we talked about, we want to give the executive team time in January to really work through everybody's, you know, who kind of ranks higher and whatnot with the FY18 program. But then in February, when you have the retreat, we'd like that opportunity to come to you with our FY18 priorities to kind of give you that feedback on, on um, the purpose and need of these projects. So, you know, what, what, what are the funding constraints? What are the funding realities for them? And, and the, really the why of their, that they're there. So I wanted to open that up for discussion. I know you guys may have already talked about it in the morning. I don't want to belabor it if you've already kind of made your decision. Just want to know if that's going to be something of an expectation from CIP so we do have that ready for you. Um, so council direction that we're looking for is to, um, as you look at these concepts and what we're throwing at you, um, think about how we're applying them and give us some feedback on whether you think we're moving in the right direction with them. Um, and if you see any creative ways that you think it could be applied uh, to further our objectives, um, you know, that feedback is welcome. So three building blocks of GIS, uh, really data analysis and engagement. All the C's in the room just love that slide. Uh, data is something that we've worked with. There we go. See, I got Victor, I got Jared. Um, for, all the, uh, for all the C's, later on you need to uh, not look at every detail because this is uh, um, something new and it's not perfected for sure. Um, but uh, we're looking to move uh, data, and, uh, which we've done for a while. We have collected a lot of information on our land base. Uh, John Powell is here today, our GIS coordinator, been here a little over 20 years. John's first day on the job, our GIS was literally a blank slate. We started with monument points and streets. Uh, if you were to look at it today, uh, everything from parks to water valves and pretty much all we own, and we try to make everything we own um, in that map. Uh, streets, water, parks. So 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock up on that uh, slide, we've been doing for many years. Uh, where we're planning to go is uh, using a lot of operational information and starting to map things like revenue and expenses so that we begin to see visually um, where our budgets are going and what parts of the community it's impacting um, and using it as a planning tool. So that moves us squarely into the analysis piece and that's, that's really what's gonna be new. Um, you've seen GIS in many silos of our organization. There's uh, many planning commissions where you've seen uh, GIS used or maps used. Uh, we use it in our police dispatch for dispatching, we fire dispatch and so on. Um, the key is though is when you start putting all of these sets of information and using them across departments and then looking at them on a community impact as opposed to a line of service impact. So uh, we're gonna put together some, some uh, examples of that. And I got three examples today. I've tried to pick just some various parts of the community and different lines of service. Uh, and the first one we're gonna look at is uh, what I'm calling Ocotillo Bridge. So we're gonna look at how we have a fire station going in there. We're gonna look at some operations information from fire. Um, gonna talk about how that relates to the regional park and uh, how that all ties into the bridge project that's proposed for down there. And we're gonna see how all of those interplay and how the timing of them go. And I'll tell you, one of the fun things about doing this technology has been every person I've talked to has had a different input, a different question, a different what if. Um, and to me, it, it engages um, our staff in a way that will help us solve problems um, better and predict uh, problems better. Okay. So this is um, a product that's called ArcGIS Online. It's a fully web-based uh, hosted solution for GIS. 
uh, that, that technology is somewhat new. The last four years or so, uh, that has really come into uh, being available in, in our space. Um, but we're going to talk about Ocotillo Bridge. We all know where that location is. Um, if you've ever talked with one of our assistant chiefs or Chief Joe Bush, uh, there is a strategy, a, a very intentional strategy on how we selected the location of our fire stations. Um, and we built all of them with the exception of Fire Station 9. So Fire Station 9 and the gray diamond up here. Now this is a piece of information that you've probably not seen before. Um, and this is a little bit different uh, application of GIS than we've used typically. This is operational data, CAD dispatch information that goes into the fire department and uh, uh, actual response times mapped in the community. So what's our response time in this particular square mile of town? And what you're looking at up here, anything green and yellow is, or green is zero to four minutes, that's right in our target, four to, four to eight outside of our target a little bit, and, and so on. So as we look at the community, not a big surprise, um, just in that little Ocotillo corridor right there, which is where we're building Fire Station 9, is where our, our response times um, are slowest. So taking a little closer look, you begin to see Immediately, there's a regional park here. I think we've all heard about that. We all know about that. When I think about this part of town, I think regional park. I don't generally tend to think fire station or bridge right away. Digging in a little more, uh, fire station nine, right, right here. So, neat thing about this is it's being a web technology it can incorporate different technologies and it can take us different places just like the web does so one of the things I've done here is uh, I just clicked on a CIP project it brought us up that overall description I clicked on that link it took us to the CIP that our budget group perfect timing but uh, published just uh, last week uh, but not only did it take us to the book it took us to the page so it navigated that information for us. So we really now get to kind of look through the CIP book in a visual form, and we get to understand how projects play to each other in a visual instead of uh, um, just trying to flip through the book and understand how the uh, projects fit together. So you add to that Ocotillo Bridge, and the thing you begin to realize as you look at this is the effectiveness of Fire Station 9 is directly impacted by the building of that bridge. So fire response times to the northeast, when we build fire station nine, improve the day the, the, day the uh, station opens uh, to the, what would be the northwest. They'll still improve, but we really won't get full effectiveness out of it until we get the bridge in. Um, again, just demonstrating the technology um, it also has the ability to wrap into it photos. So you can begin to make this personal. This is what it looks like if I turn left out of Fire Station 9 the day after we build Fire Station 9. Um, Evil Knievel ramp and fire trucks, I'm told, don't work together. Tried to get Chief Duggan to go for it, wouldn't do it. So I told you guys earlier, different people look at this map and they ask different questions and we look at different things. Uh, I sat down with Kelly, we went through this, and one of the things that popped out was, wow, look at the timing of the projects. So you got Fire Station 10, or uh, 9 rather, in 18. You got a bridge possibly in 20, but then the thing I looked at was, look at Ocotillo Road to the west. You got that in 2021. Um, if I live in this part of the community from 2020 to 2022 or 2023, depending on how long some of those projects take, there's gonna be a lot of disruption in the transportation of that part of our community. So it just, it gives us the opportunity to foresee that problem coming and maybe steer a little different direction or maybe we communicate it a little differently. Um, I think it also helps us all tell a story that um, yes, there's a lot of disruption in this part of the community, but we're putting in, you know, over $100 million worth of infrastructure and transportation and amenities in this part of the community as well. So there's kind of a, a good way to, to handle that. So that was example one. And again, the, the cool part I, I think of Mayor Lewis when I think of this is, is, you know, what we do, we do together. This is bringing together a whole bunch of different inputs 
for a whole bunch of different synergies and, and really quality decision making at the end of the day. So I'm going to bounce back. I'm going to try to bounce back to my technology slide here. Next one I'm going to look at going down more of the economic development path is employment corridors. And I'm um, going to talk about mapping revenue. It's an interesting idea. Where does our money come from in the, organ in the community? Um, something that I know I've had conversations with Ben Cooper about in the past. And I, Eddie, I think you and I have had a couple conversations about that. Um, but how does that play into infrastructure? And then again, how does that play into our CIP investment? And does it confirm that it makes sense? Or does it cause us to ask questions? Um, either way, both have, uh, both have value. So most of us are familiar with our employment quarters. Dan's done a great job of defining those and making them known to all of us. Um, one of the things that's uh, changed a bit, though, is as Department of Revenue changes have happened at the state, we've talked about those a lot. But one of the new things that's coming into our organization is revenue by address. Not ever had that before. Um, our program cities have had it, um, but our uh, program cities did not, nons did. Um, so now we're going, hey, for the first time ever, Gilbert can really know where our sales tax revenue is coming from. And we can, it, will that change how we think about our community and how we make decisions with it? Um, so go ahead, Eddie. All right. So I would love to see a map. Again, I know we're probably in violation of property rights and knowing our taxes and all that, but if it was, you know, blocks of types of commercial zoning and we knew kind of what that dollar per, we'll call it, you know, I could then superimpose on the vacant commercial property and get made an estimate of common types of zoning, right? Well, I think it's and under. You know, so <laughs> anyway, that's maybe so it'll lead you to the, the so, so Eddie, that is that is the vision, and and yes, I have uh, uh, John Olson will keep me, um, uh, he he will keep me in check. I, I know he will, um, but but there are some. Uh, once we sum it up to a certain level, um, we can apply it. Uh, I've had many conversations with with John Powell about, you know, can we get it to the land use level, or, or what level can we get it to? And exactly what you said, we know where our vacant property is, we know where it isn't gets updated from the county monthly. We have real good ways to, to focus on that. Um, and so what I have up here, and I want to focus on the word scenario up there. These are not real numbers, so don't take them away. Um, but uh, you know, if 6% if is coming out of the Gateway District, um, we know it's a very underdeveloped district at this point. We know there's a lot of potential there. That doesn't maybe surprise us. Um, you know. The 67% is kind of that neighborhood commercial right now. You know, and so that you take away some ideas about what's important to us when you look at that information. Um, but, and I'm going to focus on the word scenario again. What if scenario two looked like this? You know, okay, well, 27% of our revenue comes from that kind of non employment corridor area. Okay, well, that, that may change where we think in the organization we want to put our investments and, you know, what we maybe want to pursue more or less. Uh, so far, we've received one month worth of information. Um, I will say there is a ton of quality checking work that we're going to have to do to really make sure that we feel good about the information that we have. And we're going to have to work out some new procedures with John Olson to make sure that we're uh, respecting all of the requirements that we have and the responsibilities we have of having that information. So I'm going to switch up a little bit. I'm going to go to Northwest Corridor and think about, think about Northwest Corridor, one of our older um, employment best quarters. Neighborhood to best neighborhood to live in, is what I hear. I, I, I'm not seeing. It's a redevelopment area. I'm not. I'm not. Oh. <laughs> I'm not touching that one. Um, uh, but what I'm going to do now, I'm going to I'm going to bring in another data set coming out of Public Works. I and mean, we've had different. We know about main breaks in Gilbert Road. We've talked about different uh, pipe types and how long are each of them going to be. And so one of the questions I ask when I look at this and move this over just a hair is where's the ACP pipe? I know that there's some in that district because it's our older district. Um, put that on the map. Everything in red up there is something that we've collected over the years as base maps. So we begin to say, 
is that a problem? Um, all the stars up there are, thanks to Jessica's team, things that uh, our distribution group have uh, recorded as main breaks. You'll notice there's not much correlation between the main breaks and, and that particular pipe in that region. Um, so that may, we may walk away with some different takeaways about how big a problem is that and what life expectancy can we really plan on and we're starting to work with some real um, I, you know, empirical data that, that's ours. Um, so then the next question you need to ask is, um, where are our CIPs at? And so this gives me a lot of confidence because I look at that CIP up there that's connecting those two non-looped mains and I'm going, okay, we know that that pipe has had some trouble in the past. We're taking a good step to loop it, which will ensure the business is there. Don't, are not out of service. It's very much what I do in IT, just I do it with cables and Jessica does it with pipes. Um, so, and then if you look at that project up here on the north side, um, and again, I could click into that and take you to the CIP book. The first thing you'll see is uh, they're putting that improvement in there for um, fire service to that business district. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about this plan right now. Um, purpose of this map is this project right down here. So we're extending a water main into that particular part of the business district. I've not had the conversation with Dan or Jessica yet as to what the strategy or cause of that is, and I haven't had time to read that page of the CIP. But we, we know that there's an intentful action going on right there. <coughs> Keep going, uh, and I'll speed up a little bit here, but Wastewater project, another one that we're familiar with. I think we all know the reasons that we're doing that particular one. Um, so I'll, I'll keep on moving. Um, but have you? <laughs> behave, Eddie, behave. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Swimming pool, Eddie? I just. Um, so, so one of the other pieces here, though, there's a parks project running right through the middle of this. We've got a trail improvement that's coming right through the business district. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm personally not sure if that's a, a, an important uh, piece to the business community or not, but I think there are some regional trail connections that are significant um, with that particular project. So then you take a look at streets projects. Um, and, and the next, I'm going to give you a little preview. One of the next maps you're going to see in a bit is a whole bunch of work we've done on LRIP relative to pavement. Um, I could very easily lay into this a 0 to 100 score of all the streets in this business district and start telling you what the condition of our road transportation infrastructure is here. Um, I didn't put it in there just to, to keep us moving along. Um, but there are uh, Cooper and Guad, I think we all know that one. Uh, there's also some left turn safety projects and they're speckled throughout. Uh, this business district. So zooming out literally and figuratively, um, at a macro scale if you ask the question are we being responsible and sustainable with our northwest corridor, um, I, I feel pretty good looking at this map that we've given this area a lot of thought. Um, one of the things I, again, kind of back to timing like the last project is, if I start looking at timing, does the timing make sense and are we playing to each of our projects um, across departments and lines of service? Are we being smart in the way we're doing it? Um, this lines it up for a perfect conversation for that. All right. So I, I gave away my thunder a little bit. We're going to take a look at long range infrastructure as well. So. Uh, Kudos to the streets group on this. Um, we really, that group's taken LRIP to heart and you're gonna see some really good stuff here on, on inventory, doing some measured condition and forecasting and then working with uh, budget to establish a, for a sustainable future um, as well as a, a maintenance plan and an ability to communicate it, so. We have for every street and subdivision in the community now a zero to 100 score based on automated testing, very consistent, very automated approach, um, very much a national standard approach way to do this um, of what the condition of our roadways are. Uh, 
and we can put it into a map and visually show you. So if any of you notice the map by the door, in or out, um, the thing I love about maps, you can look in there and say, what is it in my community? And I would be willing to bet a number of you have looked at that map probably have done that. Um, integrating video. So uh, when, when they come out and do the automated data collection now, uh, for their own QC reasons, they collect video. It's sort of a bonus they add on to the end. They give us the video with it. Um, but we have the ability, that video is all spatially coordinated. So this is a 25 to 50 pavement condition index PCI video. And I grabbed just a little snippet of it. But if you wanted to know what does it look like, how bad is it, th this gives you an idea. And of course, a perfect road, we're all familiar with the perfect brand new paved road. But what's, what's a 50? Um, this puts some context to what is a 50. Um, the video we have internally is a much higher resolution. You can really see it, it's amazing, really. Um, so we put all that stuff into a computer. We put it all into a software. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, there's a whole bunch of people with PhDs have have studied pavement and the way it deteriorates and what climate and how you treat it and what's the best economic forecast way to do it. Um, they built a piece of software. We've done that. Um, we now have five-year forecasts of pavement maintenance plans. Um, so zoomed in on this area, just stepping through. 2016 forecasted maintenance looks like that. There's a legend here that will tell you what type of treatment. Do I do an overlay? Do I do a slurry? And so on. Um, stepping through that some more, though. Um, there's 2017. And let me, uh, each one, my screen shrunk up a little bit on me. Um, 2018, 2019, 2020. Um, you can see, I, I've, I've now, if, if I'm chance out in streets, I, I have a plan. I have a plan. I can tell anybody what my plan is. I can go talk to budget about what my plan is. I can forecast whether I'm over or under going into the future. Um, but then, kind of like everything else, if I'm, if I'm doing something with the street, uh, right, Victor, I don't want to build water pipes after I pave. I really prefer to do those first, right? This works out better that way. And try to do it that way. Yeah. Um, so just like we did everything else, we can take a look at where are those future water projects. Where are the, and, and you can do all this with the CIP now. You really can if you go through and study all the pages and you are, are you know, there. But in this map, it just comes out. Um, you, you can take it in. And again, it makes you ask a bunch of different questions, but um, tra traffic projects. And uh, so a couple of fun things. I was talking to Chance out in the streets as I was doing this project. Um, and he started telling me how using these maps, he had actually delayed a couple of his projects by a year because he knew potholing was going to happen for a fiber optic project. So he deferred them, wait for that potholing to get done so that we're not potholing you know, a year after we do the streets. So, um, our, our streets team is embracing this. They, they live by this right now. And it, it was very, uh, very fun to, to, to talk with Chance as he was doing this, Corey out there. Um, and then as I watched this, I thought, hey, that's great. We have a CIP project right where all that overlay work is going to happen. And then this morning, prepping for this, I clicked on it, went to the CIP book, and realized that that's a, that's a project for streetlights. That project that's right there, that big, huge one, that's streetlight replacements. That's not pavement. So immediately I'm saying, okay, we have a question to ask. Um, I can tell you that that is planned work and it has been budgeted. Uh, Chance gave me a map of next year's work. Um, so it, it's all coordinated. But I think the really exciting thing is, is I think this is, this is our long range infrastructure going into the future. Uh, very data driven, very visual, very interactive. Um, and again, I, I, when I think best in class organizational vision, doesn't get much better in, in terms of managing pavement than where we're at right here.